Welcome to A Moment in Time with Taylor. Thank you guys for watching live and on the replay. We are live right now on Periscope and YouTube. If you miss this, you can always privately message me, direct message me, any questions, comments, anything you want to talk about. All my contact information is on the website, nextjuice.com. And while you're there, if you want to click the support button, you can help us to keep this channel going and growing together. I read a new book every single week. 52 books a year is my goal each year. And that way you don't have to read that many books. And I do live reviews and summaries like this. I also write the reviews on Goodreads if you're on Goodreads. Or you can get the free emails sent right to your email inbox only three times a year. So I won't spam your inbox at all. And you can get reviews and summaries right there in your email totally for free at nextjuice.com. Hey, Josh, first comment on YouTube. Britt, first comment on Periscope. Hi, Rody again. Hi, Lightning. Hey, Lope. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hey, James. Thank you guys for coming in. I'm really excited to do this broadcast about this book. I really enjoyed this book so much that I actually am going to be going back to school myself, actually going to school, going to college pretty much for the first time to get my master's degree in psychotherapy so that I can help people that are dealing with different mental illness, mental health struggles. Hey, Tato, you know me? Tato, that reminds me of Muna. Do you ever play with Muna on Discord? We have a Discord server you guys can go into over there on the website if you click the contact button. So here's the book. It's called Changing Minds, the go-to guide to mental health for you, family, and friends by Dr. Mark Cross and Katherine Hanrahan. And they had a top-rated ABC TV series called Changing Minds in Australia, and Dr. Mark Cross was part of that show. I don't know if Dr. Katherine Hanrahan was or not, but this book is a joint venture between the two of them, and that that show that they did about mental health actually brought a lot of awareness about the stigma that mental illness brings with it, and a lot of the things that people didn't understand about treatments and therapies and medications, so they wrote this book. So I read this book, and now I'm pretty much on that same bandwagon. As part of this, so if you guys don't know the history of this channel, I started this channel because I used to cut myself and I used to want to kill myself back in my teenage years. And I wanted to start a business. I never knew it would be live streaming, but I wanted to start a business or an organization that could help people that were feeling that way or to prevent people from ever feeling that way and basically to prevent people from killing themselves. So becoming a therapist is right in alignment with that, I think. And this book really kind of like really kind of sealed the deal for me on wanting to get involved with that and more and more I've been doing this now for nearly two and a half years going live every single day on Periscope same username over there whether you're watching on YouTube or Periscope it's next juice everywhere and I'm getting more and more people that are either becoming more comfortable with me from knowing me for so long or because I'm so open about talking about my history. They message me about their depression, about their anxiety, about their PTSD, bipolar disorder, um, you know, even gender. What is it called? Gender dysmorphia. I've definitely been in contact with people who have psychosis or schizophrenia, and I don't know the, mo the best way to help them. So I can be a friend and I can listen, I can be there for you, but I would really like to be able to have some type of skill set in actual therapeutic modalities. Not that I want to make my money as a therapist, but so that I can help people in a more real way. And I keep saying like help people at the next level. So that's really what I'm focused on right now. And this really helped me. Do I want to get licensed? Yeah. So that would be psychotherapy. So you have to have a master's degree to become licensed as a psychotherapist. Um, to be, I won't be an actual psychologist, which is a PhD, although the treatments and modalities are very similar. Again, I'm not really trying to make money off of that. I just want the skill set. So I think a master's degree is enough for what I want. But at that point, I can always go on to get my PhD if I decide to do that. And Josh said, what's fair? Good. That'd be cool getting licensed. Yeah. Thank you, Javon. Very kind of you. Brent, thank you for all those super juice boxes. Look at you go. Brent's like, I'm going to get a shout out for being the top contributor of Super Hearts in the, in the month of June, and you guys better not get ahead of me like you did in the last broadcast. Hi, Ed. <laughs> thank you, James, for the first two parts of the broadcast. You've been waiting for this book review. I know, I know. I'm going to get to it, I swear. Hi, Victoria. I just want to seal broken. Wait, what? Did you just go to the bathroom? <clears throat> 
just bought the book only on chapter two you just bought it you know what's really i feel really bad about this because i forget who sent me this book i believe it was given to me as a gift but i don't remember who gave it to me so thank you to whoever sent this to me um I really, really, really enjoyed it, and I'm going to dive into it now. So the way I'm going to go through this is I'm just going to go through the, in the table of contents, they have it broken down into the different mental health issues and struggles that people deal with, and I'm just going to give kind of an overview, a pretty semi-brief, I'm never very brief, summary and explanation of what I took from the book, but if you struggle with any of these things, I recommend that you either get this book or you can type into the chat and I can read out some of the resources. At the end of every chapter, they have actual resources like websites, um, phone numbers, hotlines, things, places that you can call, support groups you can connect with, and resources to help you deal with whatever you're dealing with. For pretty much all of them though, I think that you should see a therapist. That you should find a therapist that you like and be talking to them on a regular basis. That seems to be very, very helpful in pretty much all of the things we're gonna be discussing in this broadcast. Hey, Brittany, you have to, oh, you have the psych, you have a bachelor's in psychology. Okay, Gruff, you have to go back to school for the master's. Yeah, what, what do you think you, your master's degree would be in? So uh, psychotherapy is just one option. You can do just psychology. You could become, you could get your uh, master's in social work. There's a few different ways that you can do that. Isn't that the one that came anonymously? Nope, that was the um, mindful, or no, awareness book. Sorry, my nose is just open and that is not cute. But, Ed, why are you awake? You're supposed to be sleeping right now. Ooh, my nose is red. Hi, Rudolph, what's up? Tina, hi, hi, boxing. Those words fit in a face. Yeah, I don't use Snapchat now. Thank you, Lou, for the super hearts. If you did get your PhD, you could say that Next Juice is doctor recommended. <laughs> kind of. I People with doctorate degrees that call themselves doctors is a uh, gray area. I feel like that kind of presents yourself as a medical doctor and you're not. So I don't know. I mean, technically, I guess you could call yourself a doctor, but I don't think I would do that. Hi, Alan. How are you? I love you too, Ed, but you really need to uh, get some rest. <laughs> My night's going good, Jaybird. How are you doing? A bachelorette's in psychology? No, no, no. Um, I would go for psychotherapy. Psychotherapist. I disagree with you, mate, but you know, teach their own. You don't have to get your master's in psychology. That's up to you. <laughs> you were clinical psych, but maybe psychotherapy. I also like industrial and organizational. Yeah, the more I learn about it, the more I might change my mind as we go about. But this isn't about me. This is about this book. So we're going to get to that now. As a doctor, I recommend this. I'm in school to get my master's in psychology and addiction. Oh, okay, yeah, that's that that's potentially a path that I would want to go down. Addiction, addiction's another one that I hear from people too. Um, okay, yes, Jaybird, yes, get some rest, get some rest, you guys. Good to see you too, Alan. Okay, I'm gonna get into it now. So, they talk about they start the book talking about the stigma of having a mental illness and realizing that you're not alone. It's very common, and that. As a gener generalized rule, as a society, we don't seem to really understand what it means to have mental illness. One of the facts in here I found interesting was that people with mental illness are not any more, they're not any more violent than the general population. Things like alcohol make people tend to be more violent than someone who has mental illness. Now, in my personal opinion, now this wasn't in the book, but I would say that people with the antisocial personality disorders, like sociopaths, psychopaths, people who lack the ability to experience empathy and to feel what other people are feeling or understand what someone else might be experiencing, I can't imagine that they wouldn't have more of a tendency towards abuse, whether it be physical or not. But a lot of people think, you know, we've seen a lot of movies like Carrie and, and we've just been exposed to a lot of bad information from media. And we think, oh, well, you know, if somebody's if, if someone has mental illness, they're gonna they're dangerous. They're dangerous to society. They're gonna hurt us. The reality is that they're they are probably more likely to hurt themselves, but they're no more likely to hurt someone else, especially if they're actually getting treatment, and going to therapy, and potentially are on some type of medication to prevent them from going into a completely delusional state. And because that does happen sometimes, where people are basically not in their right mind and they behave in a way that they wouldn't otherwise behave. A lot of things like that, they talk about how a lot of this stuff could be prevented. If parents early on took their kids to get help, 
they rather than just letting it go and letting it get really out of control. Like when we hear these horror stories of kids murdering their whole families and their parents, and they kind of say, you know, these kids were never actually taken into to get any help. <clears throat> And nowadays with health insurance, a lot of therapy and different things will be covered by your insurance. So look into it, Google it, learn, educate yourself, whether you have mental illness or not, we should all really learn a lot more about this. This is the type of information I think should be taught in public schools. If they're going to force us to go to school, they might as well teach us something useful, but here it is. <clears throat> hey, Greg, how are you? So that's chapter one. Let me catch up with the comments here. This topic is so strong. It is, Jenna. Yeah, it's going to be deep. It is. You got kicked out? Oh, sorry. I don't feel empathy. No way. I don't feel farts in my sleep. That's what was my mistake. Uh, it's still up. I know, Jenna. I know. I catch crap all the time for my anxiety, but we don't make fun of people with cancer. That was actually a story that we shared. Thanks for saying that, Brent, that uh, one of these doctors, were, were they had a patient who said, you know, I just wish that I could bandage my head. And he was like, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, if I had broken my arm and I had a cast, people would come, they would visit me, they would sign my cast, they would bring me flowers and gifts, and they would wish that I get well soon. And they would have like empathy for my illness. When I have severe depression, people don't, they, they just tell her, you know, get over it. Like, just focus on the positive. Focus on all the things you have to be grateful for. Just stop being depressed. And they don't even really categorize it as a true, real mental illness. So I posted to my Instagram channel. If you want to check that out, it's Next Juice over there, too. N-E-X Juice, J-U-I-C-E, a photo from one of the charts in this book where they taught, they did a poll and they collected all the data on what people think of these different mental illnesses from depression to schizophrenia and whether or not people think it's a real mental illness, whether people think that it can be cured, whether they think that, you know, these people that are like this are just weak, they're weaker than other people and all these common misconceptions and stigmas around it. So we this broadcast and hopefully you guys will go out there and spread this kind of message too. share this broadcast out if you haven't already and just kind of break that stigma down because that is one of the biggest things that keeps people from getting treatment from getting help and then they could potentially take their own lives or even you know worst worst case scenario so the, I guess that's really the worst case scenario is that any lives are lost because of mental illness especially untreated yeah, Josh says, broken arm gets empathy, broken mind gets funny looks and avoidance. Exactly, that's exactly what it was about. You were a caller on C-SPAN talking about stigma and mental health. Wow, interesting. That's awesome. Well, good job on that. Most people have some issue at one time or another. That's And they talk about the stats, too, on, on how many people are affected by different types of mental illness. But isn't this channel based a lot on mental health by way of positivity? and informative scopers here absolutely boxing yes hi 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 trevor sorry i almost said tina welcome everyone who joined recently yes um psych is awesome good money yeah so for me i'm not doing it for money i'm doing it so i can actually help like audience members and people that i meet that have these types of illnesses not that i would become their therapist per se if i did do that i'm sure i'd have to get paid to give that much time up but just so i i know maybe like a good question to ask or can direct people in a better path and, and just be more better equipped to handle the types of messages and concerns and, and things people come to me with because I'm I don't feel well equipped for that right now like the man talking to himself at the bus stop the other day yeah okay I'm missing a lot of comments here I want to read the comments so bear with me this broadcast is probably going to be quite a while uh, I'm good Greg thanks for asking thank you for the super hearts Brent thank you for all of those Please read my message at some point. I will. I check all my messages on Mondays, so I'll definitely read it by Monday. Uh, I know it's Tuesday, but I'm, I do my best. <laughs> There's 88,000 people that follow me, so I'm doing my best. I don't have cash app, no. Thank you, Trevor, for the super hearts. I love you too, Hector. And I don't want to make a promise to you, Jenna, that, I'm, that I don't keep. I don't want to be like, oh, I'm going to check it right after this broadcast because I have to do another broadcast after this and maybe another broadcast after that. So I don't want to like say I'm going to do it and then not do it. So I'd rather say, I'd rather make a promise I know I can keep, which is that I check all my messages on Mondays and I'll try to do better than that. But I, I do the best that I can. All I heard is Brent wants to wrestle me. Did anyone else hear it that way? I did. Yes. 
like the Virginia Beach guy. Yeah. Treatment isn't easy. It scares me. What What's scary about it to you, Jenna? Hold tight. I heard wrestle. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Why does Ed want to wrestle everyone? I only... Someone said whipped poop about the last broadcast. I think it was Josh. Really good money is being a psych nurse. Unrelated to book as it's more inpatient. Pro tip. Ticks can attach. Oh, okay. Great. I thought you checked messages on Saturday. I changed it to Mondays because sometimes we have the kids on Saturdays. So I, it was becoming way too much of a... It was way too difficult to do that. So on Mondays they're in school and I can do it much more effectively. Hi, Scott. How are you? Okay, here we go. Chapter two. Uh, where can I get help understanding the system? So this is a book from written by Australian doctors. So this is very particular. The information here is really for people who live in Australia. So I would recommend using Google, just looking up support groups, websites, information, books of your own, and maybe even calling your insurance company and seeing what therapists they cover, what they recommend. You can call just your general practitioner, your just general doctor, and ask them, you know, your primary care doctor, ask them, who they recommend and, and just let them know what's going on and ask them for a referral. I'm so sad. It's just sad. I'm so close to giving up. Oh, it's going to get to a point where I'm going to up and just not be here. I'm too weak for this. So, but what are you afraid of, Jenna, with um, getting treatment? Oh, good. So I can troll you on my lunch break. Kidding. Love you. I love you too. I love you all. I love you. Okay. Uh, the next one. Chapter three is about depression. So what I found interesting in here personally, because I have my own experiences with depression a bit, so uh, I, I definitely have experienced a lot of it. There's a lot of interesting things in here. One is that um, in terms of bipolar disorder, which I believe is the next chapter, there's bipolar disorder, which is characterized by depression and mania. We'll get into that in a few minutes. But sometimes doctors will call depression unipolar depression which basically just means that you have this one pole, which is depression. I've never heard of that described that way and kind of thought of it as like depression is like half of what people with bipolar disorder deal with. So people with depression, basically they're going to have a hard time concentrating. They're not going to have really great energy. They're going to feel worthless, like they have no value. They're not going to have a lot of motivation. Um, they're not going to feel, or they are going to feel like, Talking about it is going to bring people down, so they may or may not want to talk about it. They talk about, in, in the last chapter here is suicide. I'll probably touch on it you know, as we go through. People with mental illness are more likely to commit suicide. Now, we don't have to be afraid of talking about suicide because nobody commits suicide because somebody mentioned it. Like, if I'm talking about suicide, people sometimes people don't want to talk about suicide because they don't want to give anyone any ideas. But nobody, like, it's not like people, like, never like they don't know what suicide is and you're like just brought it to their attention that it exists. And sometimes they don't want to talk about it because they don't want to bring you down. Or maybe if they're really seriously considering it, they don't want anyone to try to stop them. They don't want to get um, put into. So there's like mental health acts where if you're talking about wanting to die, you know, they can basically like force hospitalize you. They can force you into a mental ward to, for your own safety, your own protection, because in psychology experience, they've learned that most people who are suicidal only feel that way temporarily. Not everyone. There are some cases where as soon as they get out of the hospital, they go and commit suicide anyway. But most people are pretty grateful when they are basically protected from making that choice and then realize that they don't want to do that, that there is hope, that there is a future for them, that the outlook doesn't have to be so bleak and that they were just in that state then. So we can talk briefly about me uh, medications as well. I personally used to be very anti-medication myself. Now I've come to realize that there is some use for some medications and most doctors don't want you to be on medication for your entire life, but there's exceptions to every rule and, and you just have to see what works best for you. So antidepressants can be very effective at increasing, I believe it's serotonin and norepinephrine at levels, or in some places they call it noradrenaline. Noradrenaline and norepinephrine are the same thing. I learned that from this book too. Um, they increase those levels in your brain, which can help to basically stabilize the way that you're feeling and 
cause you to potentially realize that uh, you don't that you're you're not better off dead and that the people in your life this was a common feeling I had when I was wanting to kill myself was I felt like everyone else would be better off without me because I was always bringing them down because I was depressed and I was a burden and I was young so I wasn't working and my mom had to pay for everything for me and I saw that that was stressful for her because she was a single mother and I thought well she'd be a lot better off without me and nobody else is going to care if I'm dead so I should just kill myself and I thought of different ways to do it and so forth. That's not the reality. If you take your own life, if you kill yourself, other people will not be better off without you. Actually, they'll probably be worse off because they're never going to forgive themselves for not doing something to prevent that from happening. They might blame themselves. They might have survivor's guilt. They might actually kill themselves in response to it. So just keep in mind that you're not like you're not helping other people by killing yourself. Now, that's not what everybody feels like, but that's what I felt like. And I know there's probably people out there that feel that same way. Like people will not be better off without it. They're, they'll, they're, it's something that they're going to live with the rest of their lives. And it's going to be, that's going to be a burden on them way more than you could possibly be a burden as a living person who's trying to get better and trying to get help and trying to um, manage their mental health and improve and better their mental health. So I'm seeing a lot of, Comments here. Thank you, Trevor, for the hearts. Welcome back, Victoria. Physical activity does the same way. So physical activity is going to increase endorphins. Um, it also increases testosterone, which can decrease cortisol levels. Uh, testosterone and cortisol have a direct relationship. So as testosterone hormones increase in your body, your cortisol levels decrease, and cortisol is the stress hormone. So that definitely is helpful. I think exercise is hugely, hugely helpful for mental health as is getting out in nature, getting greenery, getting sunlight on your skin. For me and a lot of my friends who talk about depression, if I ask them, have you gotten enough sunlight lately? Almost always the answer is no. If they're feeling kind of off, feeling kind of down, feeling kind of cranky, grumpy, a lot of times it's, it's a straight up vitamin D issue. So I would be, a, and I'm not a doctor and I'm not a therapist, so you know I can't really recommend this. But for me personally, I try those things first before seeking um, like something like an antidepressant or something, which I've never been on. But I remember I used to take St. John's wort when I was struggling with my depression in my teenage years. And I had a hell of a reaction when I was coming off of that. It was really, really weird. It wasn't a med it's an over the counter like supplement that's supposed to help. And I don't know if it helped or not. But when I stopped taking it, I remember like I I, my my mental state was very strange. Like I felt like I was detached from reality. Like there was like a layer of like fog between me and other people. And I just remember being like very freaked out about that experience. So that's not the same experience. But yeah, definitely exercise is good for mental and physical health. Hi, Bill. But it ex it's not like exercise and diet is going to be enough for everyone. I don't know. You know what I mean? I haven't experimented with every single thing. But from what I'm reading and, and from what I'm seeing in the world is like most people don't eat perfectly or exercise perfectly and take perfect care of themselves as it is. But even if they did, which I've never seen anyone do, that probably wouldn't be enough for every single person. Some people really might benefit from medication. Hi, Kieran. Did I say that already? If someone mentioned ice cream, I want it. I'm lactose intolerant, so close enough. Whoa. Okay. Uh, no one's bothering me, Bobo. Hi, how are you, Bobo? You're the Debbie Downer of this scope. This whole broadcast is going to be pretty um, serious, pretty deep stuff, Jenna. I don't think you can bring this scope down. This is the perfect scope to talk about mental health and things like this. Hi, Matt. How are you? It's too vulnerable for you. What's too vulnerable, Jenna? A snake cake. Because you're comfortable talking with us here about it, so it'd be the same thing. You'd except it's more private. You'd be talking with someone totally private, totally confidential, about the same things you're talking about with us here, right? A snake came out of the grass while I was in the driveway. Then a hawk swooped it up. Is that real? Did that really happen? Oh my god! They don't care about me. They only do it because they have to. Um, I mean, I can't speak for every single therapist in the world. I'm not a therapist myself. But I would say that pe most people that are in the mental health field are, aren't doing it for money because unless they're an actual psychiatrist, they're not probably making very good money. They almost all get into it because they do want to help people and they care about 
people. So to say that they don't do it and they're only doing it because they have to, I think is just wrong. Um, I, I can't say that every single person cares and that every single person gets into their field of work for the right reasons, but I know that the majority of them probably do. Like the, the next book, the next series I'm going to be talking about is The Healing Alphabet by Rosanna Snee. She's the therapist on this channel on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. She broadcasts pretty much for free on her channel all the time. People really don't support her financially in any way, and she goes live multiple hours every week on her channel. And she wrote this book, which I forget, it's like 10 bucks or something like that, and she gave me permission to read this book and share this with you guys, also for no money or kickback or anything like that. So um, obviously she's not doing it for money or because she has to. No one's forcing her to do this. She actually wants to help people. And she shares in this book that she... When she was going through becoming a new stepmom, she had to, her and her husband ended up going, <clears throat> excuse me, going to therapy, going to marriage and family therapy and counseling. And that's actually what caused her to then go to school and become a therapist herself. So that's actually her specialty. She's a marriage and family therapist. And it's because of her experience with the problems that she now helps other people with. And I think a lot of therapists probably fall into that category. Either they themselves or someone in their family had mental illness, so they got into the field because they wanted to help other people that were in that situation. Maybe they knew someone who committed suicide, and that actually motivated them. So to say that they don't care, I think, is um, kind of like there's no way you could know if they care or not. And whether or not they care is not really your concern either. It's really more like can they help you or not, right? Because we're not – you don't go to therapy because of them. You're going to therapy for yourself. So if it helps you, who really cares what their motives are or what – their personal life is like it's more about you getting the help that you need you know thank you Lou for the super hearts hi 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 everyone Tay, is healthcare costs a factor in people you need help but can't afford it would you think absolutely absolutely but there's also a lot of free like there's support groups and I assume there's probably a lot of charitable organizations that provide help in this kind of situation as well So many messages. Okay. Hey, Jordan, how are you? Thanks for sharing and retweeting, Lou. If you guys haven't shared this out, I think a lot of this information is really important. And actually boxing what you said about the cost, healthcare costs being a concern, that's part of the reason I want to become a therapist myself as well. Because although I'll probably have it available, like on my website, you'll probably be able to get counseling and therapy sessions with me because why not if people want to pay for that? I don't know if I'll be able to bill insurance or if you can take it and bill, you know, send it to your insurance, the receipt, and try to get reimbursed or what. I don't know. But a lot, I'm definitely looking to just help people. Like, I, I probably can't commit to meeting with them every week like a therapist, their therapist would, but I want to be able to help people and them not have to pay for it. You know what I'm saying? Did I miss the poop and whipped cream discussion? You did. That was the last broadcast. You wonder what I'm talking about? What is it about? MTS. I'm talking about this book, Changing Minds, about mental health and mental illness. Um, Kelly JC, thank you for those super hearts. Very kind of you. Appreciate that. You guys are making this broadcast very, I mean, you're making this channel possible. You can see my backpack. You can see my backpack. My backpack's down there. <clears throat> you have a lot of money and time. Well, that's good. I love one thing I can't say. Okay. Tina, thank you for the super hearts. Sorry for the delay, you guys. Oh, you want to see my backpack? Wait, you want to see my backpack? There it is. Talking about privates and nuts. Oh, I don't know. I'm not talking about that. I think other people might be. Oh, can I? Oh, you're because that guy's like, can I see your ads? And, oh, what are you? You guys talking about food? Good message. So many people need to hear this. Thank you, Alistair. I think so too. That's why this broadcast is probably going to be a long time because I want to make sure I'm reading uh, the comments too. Um, Juan, hello. What can you do for someone with depression? Here, and that's a really, really good question. So. Anyone that you know that you think may have mental health struggles, or if they tell you that they do, unless you're a therapist, you kind of have to realize that there's not a ton you can do for that person other than being a good friend, listening, and caring. Checking in with them. That's a really important thing. Check in with them. Anytime you think of them, check in. Send them a message. Give them a call. Make sure you're letting them know you're thinking about them when you are. You know, like, you, you can't blame yourself if, if they do something like take their own life or they continue to be depressed because you aren't licensed and trained to help people with mental illness. You can encourage them to get help. And each of these different mental illnesses we're going to talk about tonight, it's 
the way that people react to it and the best way to present it to them is going to be different. And this book covers all of that. It covers what to do if you yourself have depression, if you have a family member or loved one with depression, and what to do if you're concerned that someone's going to commit suicide. We're going to talk about a lot of different mental illnesses other, other than depression as well in here, but that's the best thing you can do is check in with them regularly, let them know you love them, that you care about them, be specific about what you like about them, and encourage them to get professional help. I think that's really all you can do. You can't blame yourself if they don't because the choice is up to them. And if you're sitting there and you have depression, you know, if someone's been telling you, like, you should see a therapist, you should get some help – only you can do it, you know, and, and you're the only thing kind of keeping yourself from that. So I really, really, really want to encourage you to, to do it, to get serious about your mental health, because it could be really helpful. It's the thing that helped me to, to heal my relationship with my mom and to basically stop being depressed and suicidal up until now. I still haven't had, you know, every once in a while I get feeling down, feeling sad, feeling depressed is a normal human experience. And a lot of the things you're gonna hear about here as symptoms of, of these different illnesses are a normal part of the human experience. Like if somebody you know dies and you experience grief, well, you might feel depressed. You might feel depressed for a long period of time. It may seem like you have depression, but there's situational depression and there's clinical depression. So it's some of this stuff is normal, part of mental health. And some of this is, it's, it could be a real problem for you if it's like, if it's like a recurring ongoing cycle. And if you're thinking about taking your own life or it's basically these things are d defined as mental illnesses if they impede your everyday living, like someone with OCD. Well, if you like, if you're like, maybe like someone might say you're like a clean freak and you wash your hands a lot and you're really particular about everything being organized and clean, but it doesn't actually like keep you from going to work and keep you from having healthy relationships or, you know, cause you to have like a mental breakdown, you could say, if you like basically can't leave your house and you have panic attacks and things, then you aren't, they wouldn't categorize you as having a mental illness, right? So we all have like our little quirks and things about ourselves, but if it, keeps you from living a healthy, normal life, then it falls into the category of mental illness. Thank you for asking that question. That was good. Serotonin, serotonin reuptake inhibitors can be good, tough, good stuff. So that's SSRIs, right? I don't know what that means, Gruff. The light switch is triggering you. You want to edit it out? Peel and Schweitzer. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Thank you, Karen. Listening is so very important to someone that needs and wants to talk. Find someone you trust. Yes. And if you feel very alone and you don't want to talk, I have people, I was just talking to somebody recently that was telling me that they don't even talk to their friends about these things because they're embarrassed and they don't want their friends to know. And that's when you can talk to a professional. I mean, these people, they, they don't, they're not going to tell your friends. They're not going to tell your family. They're not going to judge you. They've, you know what I mean? They want, that's why, that's what they're there for. That's why they went to school for many years to get the license that they need to be there so that you could contact them and talk to them. They want you to talk to them and they're there to listen. And not all therapists are created equal, just like all people and doctors and everything are not created equal. You know, we're, we all just like, sometimes you like somebody, you know, you're like good friends with somebody. And sometimes you're like, that person's okay. Or sometimes you're like, I really don't like that person. That's how it is with doctors too. And therapists too. Like some of them, you're going to be like, I don't like that person. That person's okay. But I really like this person. So find somebody that you really like and, and you feel like is really helping you and, and is whatever your criteria that you want in a therapist, make sure that you find that you can, you can basically like shop around. <clears throat> and Danny is singing. Taylor helps me through some anxious times just by talking and being a good friend. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate that. I'm glad you haven't been having much anxiety lately, though. Um, Nikki Sparkles in the house. I know what you're saying, and that's great if you can do that in the future. Yeah, I'm excited. I found that going going dogging? What is dogging? A couple of my f mom's favorites. Okay, yep, yep. Someone's therapist knows all about me and is extremely rich because of me. <laughs> Quick recap to catch everybody up. Today's discussion is, oh my god, butt berries. I missed that. Oh, because we were talking about um, poop. Um, Reese's. Okay, okay. All right, all right. I'm trying to read all the comments. I know I should get to the next chapter. We're getting caught up here now. I'm almost. You don't trust Dr. Phil? 
That's okay. You don't have to see Dr. Phil. You probably can't afford him anyway. Hi, Bjorn. How are you? I don't even know if Dr. Phil sees patients like that anymore. Always, it won't go away. I don't know what this means. In many college courses for psych, Peel and Schwitzer are authors focusing, I think, on behavioral psych. Yes. Hey, R Club, how are you? My therapist brought me out of a deep state. Good, Will. Yes. Yeah, my therapist helped me a ton. And my therapist at the time actually wasn't even a therapist. He was going to school to become a therapist at the time that I was meeting with him. And it helped hugely. So, And, and I had gone to a psych, psychologist, I think, before that. And I hated that guy. I did not like him. I saw him once. I was like, this guy sucks. I'm never going to that guy again. But then the next guy was really, really good. And I got lucky to have it on my second try. It might take you a few, but it's worth it. It is so, 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 so worth it. What's on my keyboard? The stream deck. Okay. Hi, A-Chain. Now I can't stop seeing the electrical outlet. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, privets. Is that cocktail? I can't, you can't talk to me anymore because you got muted. Um, well, okay. So. Let's get that out of here. I'm going to take a drink of water, and we're going to get to the next section. Oh, I talked to a therapist recently. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't getting therapy myself at the time. I was just chatting with her about whether or not I think she thinks I should become a therapist, what are the pros and cons. And Actually, all therapists that I've talked to from this one lived in England. I have one who's an art therapist in, I don't have, I mean, these are like people that I'm connected with. I, I don't currently see a therapist, but I probably will when I become a therapist. Um, is, she's an art therapist in Florida. I also uh, talked to a medical doctor who has their, their focus is really in psychology. And who am I forgetting? There was one other, oh, and Rosanna, Rosanna, duh, of course, um, who's a marriage and family therapist in California. So people all around the world, all different types of therapy that they do. And I've asked them, like, what are the pros and cons? Is it really worth it? Should I do it? And they're all like, yes, you absolutely should do it. I think it's totally worth it. It's going to be an amazing journey. I'm so excited for you. It's the best thing I ever did in my life. And it's just been like a lot of positive affirmation. So I'm really excited to do that myself. But anyway, with her. So I was talking to her. She's in England. And I was, she was like, well, what modality do you think that you'd be interested in learning how to do? And I was like, well, CBT seems to be like the most data-driven, most popular, most effective form of therapy, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive is your thoughts, the cognition, and behavior is what you do, the actual behaviors. And she said, yeah, she kind of like rolled her eyes a little bit, you know? She said, that's like a, that's like in vogue right now in, in the therapy world. She's like, because it, it can be easily measured with data and they, they kind of like that, that they can like put facts and figures on it. She categorizes herself more as an integrative therapist. So she feels like there's more than just the th the thoughts and the behaviors and that there's, you know, you, you have to dig a lot into the past. You have to focus on the present. You have to think about the future and that different forms of therapy tend to, some focus just on the past some focus just on present moment awareness, some focus just on the future and, and hope and, and planning. So she kind of thinks that you kind of have to like take a little bit from everything and, and incorporate that. She mentioned something I think is called Gestalt, Gestalt, I don't know how to say it, that is based on play. It's like play therapy, which to me, that really piqued my interest. She just mentioned it in passing, but I took a mental note like, that sounds like it would be right up my alley. I like that. I think if, you, if people can get playful, get get some laughs, have some fun, I think that's hugely therapeutic for all of us. So there's a lot of different types of therapy out there. Not like again, they're not all the same, you know. CBT is in CBD. I know. I always feel like I'm saying CBD when I talk about it. A good state gets <laughs> a combination is best. Maddie? Wait, just blame Maddie? No, I didn't hear about that, Danny. Oh my gosh, what? He's always telling me that I, I need to stop being just on Periscope and be on YouTube more. I'm on YouTube right now. Thank you, Brent. I appreciate that. How does one go about getting with a psychiatrist? Do you just call or need a referral? Uh, I think you probably, if you want to get it covered by your insurance, your doctor probably has to recommend you there. I'm not sure if you could just call them yourself and set up an appointment. You probably could, but I'm not really certain, to be honest. So the main difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist is that a psychiatrist can prescribe meds. They're a medical doctor and they went to medical school. A psychologist has a doctor. It's more theoretical. It's more like um, um, based on, it's more like research oriented, not so medicine based. It's probably not the right way to explain that. 
Psychiatrists utilize drug therapy more readily. Yeah. Therapists focus on behavioral or cognitive. Right, right, right. Agreed. I'm saying CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Wow, Danny, that's crazy. That's so sad. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, okay, let's read these things. All right. So we talked about depression. The next one, uh, the next chapter, chapter four, is about bipolar disorder. So this, I learned a lot about bipolar disorder that I didn't know about before. I actually know a couple of people, broadcasters on Periscope that are diagnosed bipolar. And I remember meeting them and them telling me they were bipolar and, and having like these weird, this is the stigma, right? I had my own experience of me stigmatizing these people and being like, you're bipolar? Like, you don't seem bipolar. You seem normal. You know, do you guys ever feel like someone says like, oh, they have like these something that they deal with. And you're like, oh, you seem normal to me. Like, you kind of feel like, oh, I think this person was misdiagnosed. Like, I don't think they have this. Like, we know better than, these, you know, these doctors. And that, well, and I was thinking, like, well, are these doctors just prescribing people? They just, like, they're just saying people are bipolar because people are like, well, I'm depressed and then I'm happy and I go back and forth. And therefore, the doctors are like, well, you sound like you have bipolar disorder. Then they put them on drugs and all this stuff. I could not have been more wrong and went in that experience. And this was at like late last year. So there was two broadcasters. Now, I think they both publicly talk about their, their diagnosis of bipolar disorder, but because I'm not positive and I don't want to create stigma with anyone else either, I'm not going to say who they are, but they're both broadcasters. And they're both very positive people. They were two of my very close friends when I was living in Florida. And I never really like saw it. And then I read this book and I was like, okay, now I can see it more. So bipolar, half of bipolar disorder is depression. So that's what we just talked about, depression. I actually did see that part of that in them pretty regularly. I, I could see that they were depressed sometimes. The other half of bipolar disorder is mania or being manic. Like James just said, he said, I'm manic. The high times are great. I manage the down times. Yeah, so being high feels good, right? Whether it's drug-induced or induced by your bipolar disorder. So when someone is manic, they tend to feel like they're very creative. They talk fast. They think fast. They're kind of all over the place. They don't often finish what they start. They think that they have these amazing ideas and they have all these great ideas and they have like almost delusions of grandeur where they think that they're better than other people. I believe Kanye West um, recently came out about being bipolar. I could be wrong about that too. I heard that. I haven't verified that that's the case, but that kind of, you can see that the mania really well um, exemplified by Kanye West by saying that he you know, is, is God in, in having these basically really high lofty opinions of himself. And the mania, if it gets so, so there's hypomania, Hy hyper means a lot, hypo means a little. So hypomania is like a small version of mania. It's still mania, all the things I just said, but it's not, it doesn't impact your life as much as full-blown mania. So someone who's very manic is oftentimes going to basically stop behaving like themselves. They might start to be sexually promiscuous when they weren't before. They might um, change their religious beliefs. They may change their everything that they believe about the way that people should live and, and have big revelations and basically like uproot and change their whole life and change their relationships and, and their living situation, their jobs, their habits completely. And what happens is if hopefully that changes for them, that they either get help or it switches for them for some, something basically causes them to, to snap out of it, they will have a lot of regrets about what they did when they were manic. And that can trigger them into a pretty deep depression and could trigger them to kill themselves. So like I said, pretty much all mental illness is going to be, these people are more at risk of suicide. People with bipolar disorder are at a very significantly high risk of suicide. So what hap the way that treatment usually goes with people who are bipolar is that they will be put on mood stabilizers, which is to prevent the mania. So that's to keep people from getting manic, especially, you know, hypomanic maybe, but to keep them from getting full-blown mania where they're basically just out of control. And then when they go into a depressed state, 
doctors have to be very careful because they may want to prescribe antidepressants, but with someone with bipolar disorder, if you put them on an antidepressant, especially for too long of a period of time, it could actually push them into mania. So it's, a, it's like this hard balance that people with bipolar disorder really live with. And I'm not trying to say that depression is easier to live with. I was depressed and it was like the worst thing ever, but I never really realized how challenging it must be to have bipolar disorder because the doctors don't just like put you on an antidepressant and you're fine. They have to like try to keep you in this in between this healthy balanced state of mind to keep you from being depressed and to keep you from being manic. So most people with bipolar disorder are going to be on mood stabilizers pretty much constantly. And that's to prevent, them from going into a manic state. Occasionally they might be put on antidepressants for short periods of time, maybe low doses, to keep them from being depressed. So people with bipolar disorder that don't want to be on medication, it's very challenging. And oftentimes people who are bipolar, when they're put on the mood stabilizers and they feel good and they feel healthy, they'll stop taking, this is very, very common with people by, with bipolar disorder, at least I experienced this with a member of my family, and this exemplifies their behavior perfectly. They basically think that they're fine now, they feel fine, they don't need to be on meds anymore, so they take, they take themselves off the meds, they stop using the medication, and they go into a manic state again. They go into a mania, their behavior is very erratic, unexpected. Um, I've experienced at least this person in particular also would experience outbursts of anger and um, almost like delusion, like thinking that people stole something from them, um, almost like conspiracy theories. Um, I may not say what I was going to say. So it's really, really dangerous to do that. So if you don't like the medication that you're on, go to your doctor and tell them that. See if they can put you on a lower dose. See if they can try a different medication. See if they could potentially help you to wean off of it safely if they think that's a good idea. Because just like taking yourself off a of medication can really mess up your, your body chemistry as well. Now, there was one other thing I was going to say. Sorry, I'm, I lost it. Let me just get it back here. Hmm. Oh, um, many men, oh, and I also wanted to say this too, when it comes to suicide, men, especially men over the age, I believe, of 40, especially if they've lost their spouse, like if their spouse dies or something, they're actually at the highest risk of suicide. So realizing that if you're a man and you're contemplating suicide, especially if you consume alcohol, you're at very, very high risk of actually killing yourself and realize that that is a permanent solution. You can't try anything else after that. You might think, oh, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll kill myself. Well, let's put killing yourself to the absolute last resort because you it's permanent. It's a permanent decision. So why not try some other options first? You know, why not try something else first before we go there? That's kind of, I think, a, a wake-up call to realize, like, once you make that choice, you can't unmake it and have you really exhausted all of your other options? Um, so side effects, side effects of medication. Um, with men is, men seem to, so there's side effects a lot of a lot of these medications and hopefully things will change. You know, there's always, they're always trying to find better medication that do a better job managing the symptoms with the least amount of side effects. Unfortunately, there are still side effects. Some of these medications cause weight gain, which if you're, depressed or you have bipolar disorder doesn't really help with your symptoms because it may cause you to to feel worse because you you're putting on weight and you're feeling you, you're not comfortable with your own body another one is sexual side effects and this is an important one to talk about with your doctor if you're experiencing these sexual side effects especially men um ch men are typically more they, they care more about the sexual side effects. According to this book, this is according to this, the information in this book, they, and they aren't comfortable talking about it, especially with their, not especially, but with their doctors even. It's important that if you're in this boat, if you're on some medications and you're having these sexual side effects, tell your doctor because they, again, might be able to change the dosage or change the medication you're on, try something else because they don't know if you don't tell them and you don't want to just stop using the medications because you don't like the side effects. And you may not even realize that the side, this is actually a side effect of a medication that you're on. So inability to get an erection, 
and um, having taking a longer time to orgasm, taking a longer time to ejaculate. These are things that can be side effects of medication. And for some men, it's not worth it for them to have those side effects. But you have to realize pros and cons. You know, what's more, what what's a bigger con? Having to wait longer to orgasm or selling, you know what I mean? Like stopping paying all of your bills and living in a, a shack because you're in a complete state of mania and you think that the entire world is consumerist hellhole and and you leave you know you start sleeping around with people and you contract an std and it's like it's a struggle also um a lot of people who are manic they are they experience high sexual appetite so they they feel very horny a lot and they can miss that sometimes so the the doctor in here had said to one of his patients, he's like, yeah, but oh no, this is actually uh, this is uh, people who use methamphetamine. They get really horny. And the doctor said, well, listen, don't come off your medications because of that. If you need to, I can prescribe you Viagra. You know, I can like give you something for that. If we really need to do that, it's not worth going back and using the the ice, the methamphetamine that caused that before. So I got a little ahead of myself on that one. Hey, Sharkle, how you doing? This was literally my ex-husband. Yeah, but do you have bipolar disorder? Was he diagnosed? ED is a symptom. Yeah, yeah, ED. Mine let me have a few Viagra. Exactly. See, Mark, you, you said it before I did. Hey, Jay. Uh, I think, actually, you can be on Viagra and mood stabilizers at the same time. At least that's it seems to be what the, what the book was saying. They have these places where we can go smash stuff. I've seen that, actually, to let off stress. Yeah, to let off steam. Thank you, boxing. Yeah, suicide limits your options, for sure. Best thing I've ever been told, permanent solution to a temporary problem. Absolutely. If anyone doesn't have a therapist, if you have Instagram, I can DM you his channel. And you can also help. Yeah, boxing knows a guy who, who helps people on, on Instagram, and I don't think he charges for it. Suicide is a permanent solution to temporary problem. Look at you guys all saying the same thing. Yeah. Hey, GCJ, how you doing? I'm on low doses of Celexa and Buspar as well as my seizure meds. I'm not sure what those medications are, but I'm going to learn as I when I get back to school. You like cold turkey? I won't say the scoper's name here, but he's a psychotherapist who people ring in and he talks to you. Oh, you don't want to say his name? I heard if you are on those meds, it's dangerous to quit cold turkey. It has to be gradual over months. Yeah, I mean, even people who are um, alcoholics and they drink a lot of alcohol for many years, even alcohol, which is a drug, it's dangerous to just quit that cold turkey. You can actually have really horrible side effects if you do that. So all drugs, illegal and legal, a lot of them to just quit them cold turkey without being supervised and getting weaned off in a healthy way. Can be really dangerous. Your body isn't really prepared for drastic changes in its chemistry like that. I like to think I know everything, but I also know that I don't. That's good. But there's also a very not PG meaning too. I learned about on the old Playboy channel on XM. <laughs> <laughs> James, your elbows. A Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Nice, Lou. Are you liking that? I think I've read that before. Have I read that? Is, it, is there 40 chapters in that book? I think my mom made me read that book one time when I was grounded for 40 days. You're a maniac on the dance floor. <laughs> okay. CBT has many meanings. First learned it was computer-based training. Oh, I've never heard of that before. Bipolar is the new name for manic depressant. Yep, yep, exactly. Psychologists in my uninformed options seem inferior to psychiatrists. Well, it depends on what you think is more important, medical treatment or like talk therapy, because most psychiatrists don't really do a ton of talk therapy and meeting with people for a long period of time. That's usually psychologists do that type of therapy. And then a psychologist will refer to a psychiatrist to get a medication um, a medication prescribed and then usually continue to see the psychologist. So it's kind of like, usually they, they kind of work together. They're like a team and they work with your primary care or general practitioner, your general doctor too. You missed the depression discussion. You can watch the replay, though, Sony. Which doctor is the one that can prescribe Molly? <laughs> um, maybe in, like, Sweden or something? Psychiatrists go straight for the drugs. Well, usually if you're referred to a psychiatrist, it's because they 
they think that you may need a medication. So if you've been meeting with a psychologist and they refer you to a psychiatrist, oftentimes they've they've kind of like sent over the notes and had a discussion and said, you know, I think this person may be a candidate for a mood stabilizer or antidepressant or something like that. Richard E. Tony, Ladder Esselier. Interesting. I'm just going to punch him into my... Later, oh, later is a liar, sorry, okay. I'm just gonna put him here so that I don't forget to check him out. That's pretty cool, I'll just follow him. All right, I followed him. Cool, I like that, thank you for saying that. Um, the whole of Russia is saying hello. Hello, Russia. Um, hi, tea cats. Oh, you're gonna need a bathroom break. Hi, Russia, privets. I'm good, Lakeem, how are you doing? Helps to keep abreast of these things. Yes, Barbara, it does. Oh, that's okay. No, that's okay. Boxing, no, we're all in this together for sure. You can say his name. It's all good. Can I drink sausage water? <laughs> yes. Sausage water is not contraindicated. Peace and blessings. I'm so excited. He never told me he was getting sick after sex every single time. He let you believe it was you. He might not have known. Maybe he didn't know that it was um, the medication side effect. And I'm sorry that he blamed it on you because that's there's other things that cause it too. So like, um, like if people smoke weed, I've noticed this in my own experience that people who smoke a lot of weed don't have as good circulation. So that if you don't have great circulation, if you live a pretty sedentary life, it also might be hard for you to get an erection. Did someone say ED? Yeah, I know my boyfriend's name's Ed. I get it. <laughs> Teeny antidepressants. He would take Viagra when we were dating, so I wouldn't know he had ED, and he would get sick. He would get sick. From that? Oh, he never told you he was bipolar. Oh my god, you were married? That's... Oh, guys, people people have to know, you know, what you're going through. Otherwise, they don't know. And then it's not really fair, you know, when they don't have the full information. That's sad. I'm sorry to hear that, Sean. Imagine being soft 24-7. That would definitely make a man depressed. It might, yeah, it might. Can I be dolphin berry fin? <laughs> I get permission from Shark first. You just followed him too. Good. Okay. All right. So the next chapter. So that's about bipolar disorder. Hopefully I uh, said everything I wanted to say in there. And again, if you have this, look for support groups. Talk to your doctor about it. Google around. Find forums. Find people that realize that you're not alone. There's a lot of people that have bipolar disorder and a lot of people, every person's had a different experience, right? So you don't have to do this on your own. Same thing with depression. Same thing with the next thing we're going to talk about, which is anxiety disorders. And this chapter is called I'm going to die. So LN. Hi, random person. LN. What's LN? Oh, the book title is in the title of the broadcast. It's called Changing Minds, the go-to guide to mental health for you, family, and friends by Dr. Mark Cross and Dr. Katherine Hanrahan. It's based on the ABC series that they did in Australia by the same name, Changing Minds. So anxiety. I learned a lot about anxiety here, and I was so glad that I did because I actually don't experience high levels of anxiety almost ever. And I know those of you out there with anxiety are like, screw you, I hate you, F your life, why, why are you so lucky? I do feel very, very blessed and fortunate. Now, I also know people who didn't experience anxiety for most of their life and then started to experience it at a certain point. So this, I know this broadcaster definitely talks about this publicly, so I'm going to talk about her for a brief moment because she was the first person that really exposed me to a concept of developing anxiety at a later point in life and not having it your whole life, which was Lisa Sansusi. If you don't follow her, I do recommend her. She's a really nice, awesome person. I met her in person, and she was really, really cool, and she talks openly about her panic attacks. So she actually experienced, experiences panic attacks pretty regularly and unexpectedly, and she didn't up until she was, I think, like 30 years old or so. So um, and her first panic attack was on a plane, and, and just she talks about it in full detail. And a panic attack is basically where your emotional part of your brain completely takes over your logical, reasonable part of your brain. 
So logically and reasonably, you know that you're probably fine and that you're not going to die. But you're, especially if you've had panic attacks in the past, if it's your first one, you might not know. And logically, you may think, I'm going to die. Because symptoms of a panic attack are your heart races very, very fast, you breathe very fast, and you feel like you're going to die. It's almost the same symptoms. You feel like you're going to have a heart attack, and you're sweating, and your thoughts are that you're going to die. What's happening? You might feel like you need to get out of the situation that you're in. It could be social, socially induced. It could be induced by other things, like um, Lisa was on a plane to go to her uncle's funeral, I believe. So he had died, and that could have been a trigger for her that kind of caused her to start to have panic attacks. Hi, Sean. Um, you can't realize that, though. Right. So even if you have panic attacks regularly, you still feel like you're going to die, like you have to get out. Um, you might feel like if you don't get out of there, everyone's going to die, you know, and it could be like friends that you've known for a really long time. It could be a completely chill, calm environment. It may be really no triggers, but you experience a panic attack. So this was interesting to me because I'd never really heard of that before. And then I read this book and they talk about that a lot too. And they also, yep, fight or flight goes crazy. Adrenaline goes through the roof. Yeah, yes, exactly. Which can affect your body in a lot of different ways because your, your mind convinces your body that you are in threat of dying. So you're going to experience basically what you would experience if you were being chased by a bear and your life was literally in danger of, of being gone. Um, so panic disorder is when you experience panic attacks on a regular basis. And generalized anxiety, it may, you may or may not have panic attacks with them, but volume is low. Thank you for saying that, Sean. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. I was wondering that on the last broadcast too. Is that a little better? Sometimes I laugh kind of loud and I don't want it to get too loud, but how about that? My attacks are more like I just destroyed my life by my decisions. Do you have panic attacks? I'm reading, because that could also, that could potentially be like um, bipolar. I'm reading the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook. Wow, interesting. Okay. Wow, I didn't know they had stuff like that. So yeah, you can read books about it. Again, you can get support groups, talk to your doctor about it, see what you can do. Being chased by a bear, that's unbearable. <laughs> You're too much. All right, so I'm going to go to this chapter because they, they break down different types of anxiety that I found really interesting. So um, there are four responses to anxiety. An intense physical response that leads to symptoms like a racing heartbeat. Thoughts about the situation and how to cope with it, such as interpreting things negatively or unhelpfully, like this is really bad or I can't cope with this. When you wake up and reflect on the day before. Really, our club. Interesting. I'm sorry that you deal with that. Mm. The third is a behavioral response, such as avoiding situations that could trigger the response again or feeling angry and restless. So that's like sometimes people won't go to places where they've had panic attacks before. And some people get to the point where they have panic attacks in so many different places that they basically stop leaving their house. You have anxiety too, GC. I got chased by a chihuahua down the street once. I was definitely in fear of a chihuahua. <laughs> Just kick it. Okay. And then finally, an emotional response because of just the distressing nature of the anxiety. And again, experiencing anxiety and being anxious sometimes is a normal part of life. You only really are categorized to have like generalized anxiety disorder if you if it impedes with you being able to live a quote unquote normal life. Like if you're canceling events that you're going to with your friends or canceling dates because your anxiety is keeping you from being able to do the things that you want to do. If you're not going to work because you're feeling anxious, you're not leaving your house because you're, of your anxiety. Now, the poop book was on the, the last broadcast part. Uh, so people who ex experience bouts of anxiety might have some or all of the following symptoms. Confusion, trembling, sweating, fainting, dizziness, rapid heartbeat, difficulty breathing, upset stomach or nausea, which is related to the adrenaline response. Um, restlessness, avoidance behavior, and irritability. They talk about, okay, so the, yeah, so here they talk about panic disorder, agoraphobia. So they actually talk about agoraphobia, fear of leaving the house, as an anxiety disorder. Um, social phobia, so this is where you avoid social situations, uh, oftentimes with new people. 
that you don't know because it causes anxiety. And that could also be linked to being an introvert. So people who are introverted oftentimes feel anxious about being around people they don't really know. So being aware too, if are you just an introvert and you just don't really like that? Or do you actually have anxiety and you have like social phobia? <laughs> Danny, thank you. <laughs> I'm like, just kick it. Come on. <laughs> I only laughed because he said LOL at the end of his statement about the chihuahua. And I know him pretty well. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder is considered an anxiety disorder. <laughs> I found a lot of this stuff interesting. So we'll talk about OCD in a minute. Hmm. And then post-traumatic stress disorder. Also considered an anxiety disorder. So what causes anxiety? It could be family history. It's a strong indicator of other people in your family. Thank you for the blessing. If other people in your family had anxiety, same thing with any of this. If they had depression, if they had bipolar disorder, you're at an increased risk of developing it yourself too. Thanks, Rudy. Stressful life experiences, such as family breakups, like a divorce, stress at work, changing jobs, moving into a new house, pregnancy and giving birth, sexual or physical abuse, excuse me, bullying or death of a loved ones are all events that might trigger anxiety. Changing your mindset made the biggest difference. Nice, Tina. So what do you mean by that? You want to share a little more about that? You guys can follow Tina too. She's a broadcaster here on Periscope. I met her in San Francisco. Super, super nice person. Um, biochemical factors. So, so there may be some medications out there that could help people that have um, some kind of chemical imbalance. Physical illness, such as hormonal problems, diabetes, asthma, and heart, di heart disease can cause worry that sometimes leads to anxiety above and beyond the normal concerned response to having a serious illness. Drug and alcohol abuse. And people with depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, pretty much all of the mental illness we're going to talk about tonight oftentimes self-medicate with drugs and alcohol because it relieves their symptoms but then it also can cause cause problems in your life, right? Because then you could it could lead to drug and alcohol abuse or addiction, substance abuse. So, a review in this book review. <laughs> it's a novel approach. I will. You've checked off lots or most of these, yeah. I'm good, Henry. How are you doing? Thank you, thank you. I just sneezed, so I did get lots of blessings. So that was good. Um, personality style is different for everyone and people with certain personalities, such as those who are shy, like I was just talking about, struggle with self-esteem or coping with stressful situations might be more prone to anxiety and thinking and behavioral styles. So here's what Tina is talking about, about mindset can put some people more at risk of anxieties than others, anxiety than others. Brett, this one goes out to you, such as being a perfectionist, wanting to constantly feel in control and avoiding stressful situations. Women are twice as likely to have a panic disorder as men. Panic disorder is if you have recurring and unexpected panic attacks, and for at least a month after an attack, you either worry about having more attacks, you worry about what the attacks mean, uh, for example, you fear that you'll have a heart attack or that you're going crazy. Mm-hmm, Brent, yep. Or you change your behavior because you fear the attacks. For example, you decide to stop using public transport or driving your car. Really, the, the thing is to see doctors. Yeah, I mean, there's certain things. Like in anxiety, one thing that I thought was really interesting, especially as a yoga teacher, was that mindfulness and present moment awareness is hugely helpful it, it's proven to be very beneficial for people with anxiety in particular and i will say that that in this book anxiety is one of the the, the um disorders that seems to be the least medicated i think both of these authors are psychiatrists so they definitely talk about how beneficial medications are a lot in this book but anxiety it didn't seem like it was a highly medicated condition um it's the I, which i enjoyed as a yoga teacher that present moment awareness and mindfulness seems to be really helpful for people with anxiety. So that's, that's good news. I think I'm a perfectionist and people pleaser. Oh, you know, on last Thursday, Rosanna who wrote the healing alphabet, she was on this channel and she was talking about, I'm blocking her name here. 
um, she was talking about being a how be, being a people pleaser could be a really really bad habit. So stop saying sorry and stop saying yes to everything. <laughs> okay. Um, agoraphobia. It, the the actual definition is fear of open spaces, but this is people that are afraid to go out of their house or afraid to go to certain places because of usually fear of a panic attack. Um, social phobia. So almost everyone feels nervous about new social situations to some degree. It's a normal response to being the focus of other people's attention, either with people we know or with strangers. <laughs> Danny. Uh, but in people with a social phobia, this fear can become so extreme that they avoid all social situations and completely isolate themselves from the world. People with social phobia fear being criticized, embarrassed, or humiliated in social situations. There can be specific situations that they will always avoid. People who tend to be shy might be more prone to social phobia, but this condition is not just about normal shyness. Some social phobia, I think I know somebody who has this actually, some social phobia manifests as a tendency to say the wrong thing when in an uncomfortable social situation. And in my experience with the person I'm thinking of right now, all social situations are uncomfortable for them. Yeah, you hated them. So you don't get panic attacks anymore boxing? Why do you think that is? What helped you to not have that anymore? schedule post oh um preview the preview app hey the pool how are you <clears throat> this sort of anxiety has a manic energy about it so we were talking about mania and and you know fast thoughts fast uh, speech that could be anxiety in mania can be pretty closely a lot of these disorders are kind of it's hard it's really hard for physicians to and, and psychologists to diagnose people because there's so much overlap and gray area in all of these. You realize you really should shut up and then you just dig out more of a hole for yourself. Part of you is absolutely cringing with embarrassment and shame. Of course, me telling you that this is really common does not help you in the actual situation. And even if you don't then run for the door, you wish you had and the evening is ruined. I have not day, no. In college, studying for a final in the cafeteria. Oh, I'm sorry, R. That's so sad. It would be useful for you to engage in some form of therapy. Okay, so generalized anxiety disorder. Oh. Had you eaten that day, R Club? Because that sounds like me when I don't eat enough, like if I forget to eat. I feel like I'm about to pass out and my, I get like weird, like I, everything sounds loud or far away. And like, yeah. Might get like low blood pressure. My face goes totally white. You had to stand up and walk out. Generalized anxiety disorder does not manifest itself as a particular phobia. It's more about feeling excessively worried all the time. People with generalized anxiety disorder feel worried even when there's nothing particularly stressful going on. They worry about things like work, health, family, and financial issues, and these worries can become uncontrollable. Nearly 6% of the Australian population will experience generalized anxiety disorder in their lifetime, and it tends to affect more women than men. <clears throat> Sometimes there's more difficult to treat. There's not usually one thing or place that triggers the anxiety, and it can happen at any time. The more people around you try to calm you down, tell you not to worry that it's all in your head, the more anxious you become, you start getting snappy and hate yourself for being that person. But the mind numbing headache, the pain in your neck and upper shoulders, the sweaty palms, the racing heart and the difficulty breathing do not help you be any more understanding. All you want to do is go crawl into a hole somewhere. A person who has not experienced anxiety has no real understanding how debilitating the mind turning thoughts can be nor the effect they have on everyday function. And that's me. Totally me. It's all in your head worse than you can hear. Yeah. Obsessive compulsive disorder. So actually hoarding is used to be considered a form of OCD. Now it's separate from it, but hoarding is considered kind of like a compulsion as well. People develop OCD because they have unwanted or intrusive thoughts and fears that cause anxiety. They try to relieve this anxiety with particular behaviors or rituals to distract themselves from these thoughts. 
There's a really good series on this called Obsessed. I think it's on Netflix. I found that show really fascinating. There's some really nice holes. <laughs> so there's a huge variation in the way that OCD can manifest itself, but a few of the common symptoms include cleanliness or order, excessive hand washing, obsessions with order and symmetry, like obsessively organizing drawers and cupboards, um, counting, repeatedly counting objects, I do. I have like mini counting compulsion. I count things, but I don't really care if they don't. Like I like to count to thirteen, either five or eight or thirteen. Eight plus five equals thirteen. So those are my numbers. But I don't really care if it doesn't land on those numbers. That's why it's not considered OCD because it doesn't actually in affect my life or hurt my life in any way. But it is like a little mini compulsion that I have. If I hate meetings at work, should you be concerned? Nope. That sounds like mental health. <laughs> You count seven, seven, five. <laughs> That's funny. But just like, to me, it's like, I don't like, it's not like I need to go back and do it again if it doesn't land on that number or something like that. Um, safety or checking obsessive fears about harming yourself or others, which causes obsessive checking that the stove is turned off. The windows and doors are locked. Um, sexual issues such as irrational disgust about sexual activity or um, I'm not going to say the last one because I think it'll trigger people. So I really have to pee, you guys. I'm really sorry, but I've been live for an hour and 15 minutes, and that's, like, as long as my bladder will last. So probably because I drank this entire lockdown of water. I love you guys. I'm going to set this down, and I'm going to be right back, and I'm really sorry about this, but I will be back. Sorry. Sorry guys, I'm back. This is why watching replays is so awesome because you can just skip through that stuff. Awkward silence. I'm sorry if it was awkward. Hopefully you guys kept talking so it wasn't too awkward. Um, hi, we're back. Okay, so I was also thinking while I was peeing <laughs> that OCD can also be connected. I think they talked about it a little bit. Like people with anxiety could be, you could be more prone to experience anxiety if you feel like you want to have control over everything. And OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is oftentimes a way of trying to have control over something, especially if you feel out of control of something else, like if you were previously physically or sexually abused or somebody died or there's something, you know, you have something going on health wise, you may go into a, a, you're trying to find something that you have control over. Yes, I'm back. I'm back. 
I missed the gym again. Oh, well, that's 20 years in a row. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. How dare your body? I know. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Just randomly do it. Yeah, ran. Okay, yeah. I have OCD when I leave the house checking to see if my flat iron is off. How many times do you check it, though? Get a Courtney. Who's Courtney? Has Ed ever dealt with anxiety? I guess a lot of self-employed people do control related. I don't think so. I don't think I've ever seen Ed be anxious about anything. Got enough water? I know, I drank this one, so now we're on to the next one. These are two really big bottles of water, too. This one doesn't look as big as it is next to this giant one, but this one is really big, too. It's 33.8 ounces. The water bottle is almost as big as you. I know. It's not too big, though. Like, if I put it on my shoulder, it's not that big. How many years has it been since you last felt depressed? About 10. I'm going to have to pee in five minutes, probably, so let's try to get through this. <laughs> okay. Did you cover all the anxiety disorders? Um, Specific phobias. So you could have phobias about different things. Um, a lot of people with anxiety also have depression. And that treating anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy, excuse me, and some people do use antidepressants to treat anxiety as well. Excuse me. Hi, Abby. Whew, my body's like, what's happening right now? Uh, there's also a group of medication that are um, like sleeping tablets and medications they use in the short term to ease anxiety symptoms, mainly from the benzodiazepine group. Um, but they're very, they get a bad reputation because they're very addictive. Thank you, Abby, for the super heart. I'm always aware, this is what the author says, I'm always aware of the abuse potential, but in the risk-benefit debate, when I see how people suffer from their symptoms and that the use of this medication can mean the difference between be being able to work and not, or being able to get on a plane to attend a funeral of a loved one and missing it, then I am more practical in my approach. So, diazepam, I forget, what's like the really common one? I forget what oh, thank you for the super hearts, you guys. There's like, a, what is it, val Valium? Yeah, to treat anxiety. Yeah, Valium. That's right. Diazepam is the, the generic name. What would 18-year-old Taylor say to Taylor today? Hmm. I'm trying to remember what I was up to when I, at age 18. I don't know. I don't feel like I'd have a whole lot of words of wisdom from then what I would say to me then I was I would just say just hold out your life's gonna be really awesome in the future and boys and what boys think of you is really not that important at all and they're they like you they're boys they're gonna like you so just stop worrying about it <laughs> that's what I would say to 18 year old myself I'm 18 year old self to me I don't know what she would say but hey Lenny I think she would say wow can can I fast forward to the future so I could just be you Sleeping tablets was great for attacks. Still knocked? Oh, I haven't heard of that. Oh, these are the people that have supported this channel over the last 30 days at nextuse.com. Actually, I want to, I know I'm like fully interrupting this broadcast multiple times, but I'm pretty sure I saw a sponsorship come in while we were talking and I didn't want to get distracted because we were on a pretty good track there. But now that we're kind of like between, you wouldn't advise people to take them? Okay. I don't think I can log in yet. So I don't have to log in right away. Here, I'll go ahead. This is fast enough. Hey, can you buy me some beer? Yeah, actually, that's probably is what she would say. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Someone supported this channel. Um, I believe it was Will Shade, right? Was that you? Um, for $5. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The link in the profile on Periscope is where you can go to support this channel and this content. I cannot say thank you enough. It helps so, 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 so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I got another little sponsorship here. 
from Mr. Popcorn here in, oh, I had, I had a little popcorn cake earlier, but I already ate it, so I can't show it, but he sent $26 and 69 cents, of course, because, you know, 69 cents is kind of a thing around here. Why do they have you so far down the list? What list? Oh, probably because I've been live for an hour and a half, so everyone who's gone live since me is above me. I advise people to drink coffee, not beer. <laughs> Two very different responses between coffee and beer, though. Um, it says you can, so if you have anxiety, you can exercise and undertake lifestyle changes, such as cutting back on alcohol and coffee. <laughs> but it is about taking control. You need to feel in control of your life again. Don't avoid going to see a healthcare professional because you, they will think your behavior is silly. You are not silly. It is always useful to get professional advice. Others can always put things in perspective objectively. Anxiety is a subjective level of distress. You can't see the woods for the trees. The very least you can do is go and see if you need treatment. Even if you think it's silly, go and talk to someone in a safe space and don't let these obsessive ruminations get the better of you and stop you from getting help. It is better to get help before things get out of hand. And that's, you know, if you've ever seen the show Hoarders, I think that's a pretty good reminder of how things can get out of hand before you even realize it. Hey, Miles. Cheers, Adobe. How are you? Cheers. I have water to cheers with. You should probably stop drinking caffeine. Mm -mm. 70 cents is overly generous. <laughs> you feel a little unstable, Abby? Do you have, oh, some people say it's bad, but sometimes you need to take them. If I don't take mine after a while, I feel a little unstable. What What is it that you take, do you want to, if you want to share with us? Good with cutting out coffee. I'll cut someone if they try and take coffee. <laughs> Has anyone here passed out from attacks? Oh, interesting. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. Someone passing out from a panic attack? Hmm. Okay, the next chapter is trauma and stress-related disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder. Passing out from anxiety is your biggest fear, but it's never happened. Okay, you get shaky and lightheaded. Felt like I was going to, but never actually have. Have you, boxing? So trauma is not just for soldiers. So there's a lot of different things that can cause trauma, and they're starting to learn that Everyone in the world has experienced some type of trauma, and not everybody reacts to trauma the same way. Not everyone who experiences the same experience is going to develop post-traumatic stress disorder from it, but some people do. I have ADHD and anxiety and social anxiety, and I take Elvan, which is for the ADHD, but it levels out the anxiety. Okay, thanks for sharing that, at BC. That's what I was talking about. Like, I used to feel like I was pretty anti-medication, but the more I learn, the more I'm like, no, medication is very, very helpful for people. Hi, Deb. I think Taylor Juice might drink more water than fish. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm talking so much, I need to keep drinking so my throat doesn't explode <laughs> into a burst of flame. Has anyone used the Calm app? I have not. I have not. Okay, a normal response to trauma. If someone experiences a traumatic event, for example, they are raped or assaulted. Hi, hi, GC sister. You have to get to the you have to get the right one though, and it can take a while. Exactly, just like a therapist, right? Just like finding a good therapist. You passed out once from the flu. Woke up face first on the bed, and a can of Sprite went everywhere. Oh my gosh, headspace. Yeah, no, I've never. Your mic's making a weird noise. It's probably because my ear is wet. better. Water is good. I'm addicted to it and oxygen. <laughs> uh, okay, so if someone experiences a traumatic event, it is normal to be psychologically distressed in response. Most people will have psychological symptoms for about two weeks after their experience, and it's important to recognize that these don't necessarily need any special treatment. Still weird feedback?
This audio is usually worse, but is it okay? It's just strange. Oh, wow, Lenny, wow. Can you guys hear me okay? This is the microphone built into my laptop, so it's kind of crappy. It's better? Okay. Good. It's not the audio, yeah, but it's just... No more feedback yet. I, I usually feel like the, the microphone in here isn't great, but okay. Excellent mic. Okay, all right, cool. So we'll go in here. Whoa, but see, it peaks so much more easily. Okay, it's just like a really crappy microphone. Okay, it's not crappy. Hissing, but better. Yeah, so you can probably hear the the um, fan of my laptop more now. But anyway, yes, juicy sister Deborah. Deborah, this is an awesome subject. Yes, I think so too. So sorry that the audio freaked out, but... Traumatized people are commonly upset and anxious, and they might have trouble sleeping and eating. Depending on the event, they might also feel sad, guilty, or angry, but most of the time, these symptoms symptoms settle down in the days and weeks after the event. Mm, you're a fan of that fan. <laughs> um, so, resilience is a term used to describe a normal response to traumatic experiences. Most people naturally have their own ways of coping with stressful events, but some, sometimes the psychological distress after a trauma is much more severe and stops the person from interacting with their family and friends and going back to work after a reasonable amount of time. They also talked about how people who, um, yeah, yeah, Deb, exactly. They also talked about people who have, um, they, they weren't modeled a, they didn't learn how to self-soothe when they were children, so their parents didn't really, like, soothe them, and they never really learned, like, how to be soothed or what soothing really even felt like. They are probably more likely to experience probably anxiety and potentially PTSD, too, if they experience trauma. Yeah, way more information for sure, yeah. Can trauma be belief-based because some people have strong beliefs? What do you mean? What would be traumatic about your beliefs? Like, what would be an example? I think that's where my anxiety sort of started. When I was bullied badly at school, right? So I, we talked about anxiety could be caused by bullying, actually, earlier. Yes. Me too, Brent. Me too. Definitely. Um, the severe response can start soon after the event, in the first days and weeks, or the response might be delayed by months or even years. The first category occurring soon after the event is called acute stress disorder, and delayed reactions are categorized as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Many people who experience acute stress disorder will go on to have PTSD as well. Um, there's also another category called complex PTSD. This happens when a person has been exposed to sustained trauma, repeated childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence, being involved in war, sex trafficking, and other extremely traumatic organized violence. Heavy hits from radical religion could be traumatic. Um... Yeah, I suppose. I would say, like, what, you know, what rituals, what behaviors are, are traumatizing? Like, is it really the belief that's traumatizing? Perhaps, I mean, like, for a while I believed that, like, I, God was going to hate me if I had sex before marriage, but I don't know that that was really traumatizing. I don't know. If so many of us see showing symptoms of mental illness as a weakness, which we talked about in the beginning of the broadcast, you can imagine what a decorated soldier must feel when they're told they should see a psychiatrist. <clears throat> no matter how tough someone believes themselves to be, we are all vulnerable to excessive stress. A lot of times people with PTSD will start using drugs and alcohol. We talked about that with a lot of the other disorders as well. Thank you, Abby, for inviting your friends. Indoctrinated faith-based sins. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse, what? So it says, in any one year, about 12... Oh, sorry. Um, not in any one year, sorry. Um, 
12% of Australians have PTSD during their lifetime. Surveys show that 50 to 75% of people have at least one potentially traumatic experience in their lives. And most say they have two or more. However, around half of the people who develop PTSD will recover in the first 12 months, regardless of whether they are treated. So the most common traumatic events that people have experienced are having someone close die unexpectedly, witnessing someone badly injured or killed, or being involved in a life-threatening, this says car accident, but I would say really anything life-threatening, oat milk. The Kool-Aid man deals with stress by busting through walls. It's probably not healthy either. There's actually, someone was talking about earlier, there's places you can go where you get to smash stuff to, to let off stress and let off steam. I've seen that before. It's very real. Um, the main categories of traumatic events that can lead to PTSD, so uh, those were the most common things. This is um, major disasters, earthquakes, floods, bushfires. This is an Australian book, like I said. Um, war being exposed to combat and death related to armed conflict. Also, you could be like um, police officers could be in this category too. Hey Lord, how are you? <laughs> oh, I love you so much. Um, rape or sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, for example, domestic violence. Even the Hulk gets stressed, I didn't even see that. I believe younger generations suffer from anxiety partly due to their disconnect from history, perhaps. Um, witnessing a violent death, a serious accident, for example, a car crash, yeah, bushfire. Yeah, well, you're in California, so you know about the fires out there, too. Um, traumatic childbirth. Any other situations that make people feel very afraid, horrified, helpless, or that their life is in danger. And they talk in here about post um, post Postpartum, wait, postpartum depression? I think that's actually in depression. That's not part of PTSD. Sorry, I should have talked about that back in, back in the depression chapter. Let me just go back to that while I'm thinking about it. Bear with me here. Okay, yeah, so... There's also perinatal depression, so people experience depression while they're pregnant as well. One in ten women have depression, anxiety, or both during pregnancy, and one in six in the year after they give birth. Up to 80% of mothers get what we call the, quote, baby blues between the third and tenth day after giving birth. A wave of sadness, anxiety, or irritability caused by changes in hormone levels. Oh yeah, Lou, that's tough. But this tearful, overwhelming stage usually passes in a few days. If the symptoms continue, it may be that you have postnatal depression. Basically the same thing, just reminding you to get help if you're having, if you're feeling that way, or if you're having thoughts, even if you're ashamed of the thoughts that you're having about potentially hurting your child, just realize that that's very common and everyone experiences high levels of stress when the baby won't stop crying and it's okay to go talk to your doctor about it and just make sure everything is all right, you know? How much longer? Um, I think we're about halfway through the book. <laughs> Boxing. <laughs> yeah, I think we've... Oh, yeah, re-experiencing the event is common with PTSD, like nightmares. And it's what's interesting to me, so I feel like there's a lot more work that needs to be done with PTSD therapy and treatment because I, I know someone well who has PTSD and has really, um, really horrible, horrible life affecting nightmares almost every single night. And when he goes to therapy, 
they take him through the event. They have him go through the event over and over. And he says, like, he's been through that so many times. And he has nightmares about this event. I mean, he's going through it, like, every night anyway. So I just, I, I read about that in here, too. They have, that's, like, a very common form of the therapy. They go through the experience with you. They have, the, they have you walk them through step by step everything about it. And they try to get you to, like, learn how to cope with it and, like, accept it and then move forward and let it go. And I don't know. It just seems like I don't know if that's the best way to do that. Um, antidepressants are sometimes used to, to, treat, to treat the depression and anxiety symptoms of PTSD. Talking therapies, yeah, where you can confront the traumatic memories in a safe environment and then work towards modifying them so that they don't cause you so much distress. The, the therapist will help you to safely and repeatedly confront these situations and activities that you have avoided. Some of the things you can do to help yourself overcome PTSD include spending time with friends and family, talking to them about what happened to you and how you feel, and developing regular work and study routines. Yeah. Well, this person that I'm talking about has had nightmares about the event for over 20 years, maybe 30 years now. Things that don't help are using drugs and alcohol to cope, working or studying too hard, withdrawing from family and friends, and avoiding talking about what happened to cause you such distress. Exercise can be helpful as well. Okay. So the next chapter, chapter seven here, is substance abuse. So this is when, you know, it's pretty common in our society to have a drink with your, with your dinner or have maybe a few drinks with your friends from time to time. But if it's impeding your ability to do work and to have healthy relationships or impeding your physical health, if you're gaining weight or losing weight, you know, depending on what substances it is, have not having trouble sleeping healthy, it's affecting the way that you're viewing the world in a way that you never viewed it before. These things can affect your life. Uh, it, it interferes with your regular day-to-day -day life, and that becomes a disorder, as we've talked about repeatedly through this broadcast. Aw, boxing, that's sad. I hope, I hope not juicy. Um, I've heard of something called, it's eye movement desensitization something like that for PTSD. That's something new I, I just heard about. The therapist I talked to in England practices that actually. Hi Tia, how are you? They talk about fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, so how do you know if your substance use has become abuse? Let's, let's do this all together here. If you recognize at least two of the following behaviors, your substance use is in all likelihood a problem. Okay. So there's 11. You're using more than you want to or for longer than you intended to. <laughs> Lou, Lou said, like, make kids. You've tried to cut down or stop your use, but it didn't work. You spend lots of time getting, using, or recovering from using the substance. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Shadow. You crave the substance. You have missed obligations, for example, a family gathering, because of your substance use. Yeah, look it up on Google Boxing. I don't know a ton about it, but if you look it up, yeah, it's called eye movement desensitization, I think it's called. It's like EMDR, I think it's called. Someone taught me about it on Periscope, and then she, she mentioned it when we were talking about if I wanted to become a therapist. You keep using the substance even when it causes problems for you socially. You have given up important activities, for example, work responsibilities, because of substance use. Mm, Jerry, I totally, totally get that. I was addicted to weed for almost 10 years. Actually, probably 10 years. Mm -hmm, probably 10 years. Maybe more than 10 years. 
Um, I actually quit in the beginning of this year. So I've been, actually today is probably the fifth month that I haven't used weed now. And it is, yeah, I still listen to him, Kyle. And it, I still have weird dreams. I had a really weird dream last night that I was a hostage in an alien ship and Steph Taylor was there and my friend Patricia from childhood was there and the alien was like trying to convince us to uh, drink this water stuff that I thought was going to turn us into aliens and whatever. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree that pot is addictive. You miss smoking with me? You never smoked with me. What are you talking about? I never smoked on my streams. <laughs> um, okay, so... Again, if you have two or more of these, you're probably, it's substance abuse, right? Thank you, spirit. You often use the substance in risky situations. For example, you have unsafe sex or wake up in a park. I have no desire to grow a baby, no. You smoke every day, it feels great. Yeah, being high feels great. I'm being any kind of substance use. People usually use substances because it makes them feel good. I have one addict and one recovering addict in the family. It's a sad disease, right? Thank you, JC. Um, you keep using the substance even when it makes you feel physically or mentally unwell. The substance doesn't have the same effect anymore and you need more of it. You've developed a tolerance. And finally, you feel withdrawal symptoms such as anxiety, sweating, trembling, or headaches when you stop. With weed, it's it's the dreams. You'll have extremely vivid dreams if you stop using it. I take little weed breaks, though. It doesn't really impact my day-to-day. -day. Yeah, that's fine. I guess. I don't know if that's fine, but it's up to you to decide, not me. <laughs> so they talk about who's at risk of developing these things. You know, poverty is a big one. Abuse. Hot boxing with Tay and private scope. Smoked together once, it was so long ago, Taylor. What? I don't, I've never met you in person. What? Lou? What? We've never met. I just described your pot habit, yeah. Melatonin gives you crazy dreams. You're like, Ed, why are you awake right now? What are you doing? Go to sleep. I'm so hungry. I want food. I'm going to, like, make fish sticks after this broadcast. Okay. So alcohol. Mm -mm. Methamphetamines. Cannabis. So here is the, the stages, right? Crave nicotine and caffeine, but you look forward to weed. It's not the same. Okay, thank you for the super hearts, Ed. Melatonin gives me weird dreams too, weird sex dreams. Ed is a vampire, yes, he is. And food too. So the pre-contemplation phase. The person hasn't considered dealing with their substance abuse, might be unaware they have a problem, and even be happy with their situation, no matter how damaging or disruptive. The next one is the contemplation phase where they are not keen on making changes to deal with their disorder and still haven't decided to take action, but they will admit to the problems the substance abuse causes. All right, good night, Jerry. Preparation phase, they prepare to take action. Action phase, they start making active attempts to change, cutting out the illegal drugs or cutting back on the amount they, they use. Maintenance phase, where a person sticks to what they have learned is critical. And the treatment can be terminated when the person feels confident they have overcome their addiction. But in practice, this might never happen, and maintenance is a lifelong state. Stage. Sorry. So lots and lots of support groups for this. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, talk to your doctor, see a therapist, see someone who specializes in um, rehabilitation. You used next juice to break your 10-year weed habit. Um, it was really probably more my stepkids that caused me to do that. I didn't want to risk 
you know, anything with them. It's not legal. If I have it here in the house, I certainly wouldn't want Ed to his custody of the children to be affected by that. I don't think our relationship would be too good after that. And um, it it was always something where, like, I knew, I mean, I was using it every day, and I never stopped. So it was like, I mean, I used to stop for, like, two months at a time, a uh, couple times throughout the ten years, but I'd always go back to using it again. And then sometimes I would be like, okay, well, I'm just going to smoke at night. Okay, I'm just going to smoke, like, after I do something productive in the day. And then I would always go back to, like, wake up, smoke, do some stuff, smoke, wake up, do some more stuff. stuff. So it, smoking eventually became vaping, but still it was uh, it was definitely not, like, within my control. And I've so, I have so much more like my life without it. Now, I don't like... The, I don't like that like alcohol is considered acceptable to use and not weed. I don't have a problem with using alcohol, but at the same time, I would much rather like be high than be drunk because I do weird things when I'm drunk. It's kind of embarrassing. I don't really do that when I'm high. And it's a, it's frustrating to me because I, I have a problem with the drug that's like less damaging, I think, to my reputation and to my life. So it's kind of it's a challenge, but alcohol is bad. Yeah, I agree. I think alcohol is worse than cannabis in terms of like health and danger level. At the same time, when it comes to addiction, like I don't, I don't have to drink every day. I don't like wake up and drink or have a drink every day or always drink in excess. You know, I can have like one beer with dinner and be fine or have nothing, you know, like most days. So it's good to be aware of it though. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of like the struggle that I deal with is like, you know, I don't necessarily desire to be sober 100% of the time either. I'm sorry, Brent. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I was going to say some more about that. Oh, like, so when I was high all the time, I realized that I was kind of detached from people a little bit. Like, I didn't really care all that much about anything. And, hey, Janine, hi, good morning. So I was, um, like, I wasn't fully engaged. Like, people would be talking to me. I probably wasn't paying great attention. I spent a lot more time, like, laying on the couch watching Netflix, um, kind of, like, mindlessly eating, mindlessly doing a lot of things, and not being my sharpest and clearest. And I would broadcast and I would like forget what I was saying or I would forget what we were talking about or I'd be kind of confused. I really don't experience that very often anymore. Um, Janine, thanks for retweeting. I actually, I guess I would get the munchies sometimes, but mostly it actually suppressed my appetite. So I would like, sometimes I'd be hungry and then I would smoke weed and then I wouldn't be hungry anymore. And I was like 85 pounds when I was smoking weed regularly. And now I'm like 103 pounds. So I've gained a lot of weight since I stopped. <laughs> but you were fun. <laughs> That's how we started dating. You totally didn't realize what was happening. <laughs> no, I wasn't like totally out of it. Thank you, Janine, for the super hearts. But I've noticed now that I'm more engaged and I have more energy and I don't take naps like I used to. I used to take naps like every single day. Um, I'll see you later, GC. My pleasure. I love broadcasting. Okay, so this one is probably my the one, th we're on chapter 8 now, this disorder is the one that I'm least well versed on and I understand the least, so yeah, yeah, Yuza, yeah, so it was, it was intense. I went to bed in Florida, woke up in Jersey, no, <laughs> um, so this is psychosis and schizophrenia, so Schizophrenia and the psychosis that characterizes it is the most misunderstood and stigmatized of mental disorders. And I still struggle with figuring out exactly how to differentiate between psychosis and schizophrenia. The why, not the what, is your is where your focus should be to stop an addiction. Um, yeah, for sure. I drove her here in a coma, that's how to do it. Okay, all right. Good night, Tina. Love you. Mwah. Psychosis is a condition where people who experience it can't distinguish what is reality as experienced by others around them. Their view of the world is distorted. 
What they are experiencing, of course, is very real to them, and what people who have never experienced psychosis don't understand is that people suffering psychosis are not just making it up, and it isn't just in their heads, even though what they are experiencing is a manifestation of something going on in their brains. People can have one episode of psychosis and recover and never experience it again. Or the psychosis can be a symptom of one of a group of mental illnesses that disrupt the functioning of the brain, one of which is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia-like psychoses actually refer to a group of around 10 psychotic disorders, including paranoid schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. Will you tell them, Brent? A disorder marked by strong mood symptoms as well as psychosis. You can get psychosis with severe depression as well as mania. So psychosis is basically like delusional, right? So schizophrenia is a collection of symptoms, thought disorder, delusions or hallucinations, apathy, emotional blunting, avolition, which means not feeling like doing anything, also a common side effect of weed, and low mood. Schizophrenia is also associated with a slowing of disruption and disruption of cognition and intelligence. A person with psychosis loses touch with the real world. The main symptoms are hallucinations, delusions, and disordered thoughts, along with behavioral changes. So we know what hallucinations are, right? Hearing or seeing something that's not there, even smelling something that's not there. Uh, or feeling, like you can feel like stuff's crawling on your skin. Pretty much any of the five senses that's experiencing something that's not actually happening. Delusions are false beliefs that aren't beliefs that aren't true or considered to be true by other people. And if you have delusions, you will refuse to accept logical arguments that the belief you have isn't true. Examples of delusions include paranoia, where you might believe someone is watching or following you, or that other people want to harm you. Or you have a sense of grandiosity, for example, thinking that you are a king or that you have special powers or abilities. It is a disorder in the content of your thinking in what you believe to be true. If you're experiencing psychosis, so this is disordered thoughts, it may feel like everyday thoughts become confused or just don't add up properly. The sentences you say don't come out in the right order or make sense, and you might find it hard to concentrate and follow a conversation or remember things. Your thoughts might also be racing or moving much slower than normal. You might feel very emotional, either unusually excited or very down and depressed, with your mood swinging a lot. Or you might not be able to feel much at all and be distanced from other people. Oh, and also they had said that if you, like you start maybe making up words. King of the castle, king of the castle. <laughs> Saw some NASA guy explain that 4D is real and it made sense. I am silver and a surfer. Caused from trauma or what triggers the psychosis? Um, let's see. It doesn't really say, but it does say people with schizophrenia have a very high risk of suicide. Um, yeah, people, anyone who has experienced trauma is at a higher risk of developing mental illness. Um, one, one person they talk about was a, a kid who was like considered pretty normal. He was like shy, but he was pretty normal his whole life. And then he smoked weed one day and then he basically like became schizophrenic. 
like overnight like the next morning he was like super paranoid that his neighbors were like watching him and knew what he had done so he went out and like smashed their windows and then ended up eventually having to go to like a mental hospital um he never like recovered you know he didn't use weed again after that but he had schizophrenia the rest of his life chapter nine gender identity and sexual disorders so this is a tough one because for a while being gay was considered something that needed to be treated so the difference between gender and sexuality sexuality is what what and who you are sexually attracted to so this could even be like fetishes like we see a lot of people that like feet on periscope that's that's their sexuality it's not their gender their gender is not foot your gender is how you identify as male or female or if you identify as um, neither or both there's a few different types in here so gender dysphoria is the distress experienced by someone who identifies themselves at, as the un other gender from the one they were assigned at birth that means people who are determined to be boys at birth but are at the core of their selves girls and vice versa of course people who simply refuse to conform to the ways society expects men and women to behave do not have gender dysphoria the key difference for people with this condition is that they feel significant distress at being expected to live as the gender their appearance suggests they have how we see ourselves how we become a man or a woman is more complicated than a doctor assigning gender at birth How we are raised plays a role in determining how we view our gender identity. Gender dysphoria does not relate to sexual orientation. People with gender dysphoria can be heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, or asexual. Asexual are people who don't have any interest in sex at all. Okay, so here are the, the three. So there's people with gender dysphoria includes people who consider themselves to be a gender which means having no gender hi life bonjour bi gender which is thinking that they're both man and woman or non-binary which is neither man nor woman also called gender queer intersex i'm not sure about that would that be considered bi gender transgender is another term often used to just include a broad range of non-conforming gender identities and expressions Hey, blue guy, how you doing? Gender dysphoria is not about cross-dressing, even though the person with it might want to wear clothes of the opposite sex. Just got off work? Nice. They talk about like sexual dysfunction. We talked about um, erectile dysfunction earlier. Lack of sexual desire, erectile dysfunction. Paraphilias is a condition where a person is sexually aroused and satisfied by fantasizing about or engaging in sexual behavior that is considered abnormal or extreme. It's a controversial area of mental health because there's no definitive explanation of what normal versus deviant sexual behavior is. That is, unless it is clearly harmful to someone else, is non-consensual, or involves anyone unable to consent such as children and those who are or those who are in some way mentally or intellectually capac incapacitated so they talk about exhibitionism which is exposing yourself to unsuspecting people or fantasizing about doing so exhibitionism typically occurs in men and the victims they expose themselves to are usually women it is not only distressing to the victim it could be the start of an escalation of sexual disinhibition and violence which could culminate in sexual assault 
So we see that a lot with people sending pictures of their penises on the internet or having their profile picture being penis or something like that. I actually experienced this when I was 15 years old. I was sitting on the front porch of my house and we had tall bushes um, that blocked our yard off and there was a man, a full grown adult man with a ski mask on. He was dressed in all black. It was like a nice hot summer day. He had a black ski mask on and he was playing with his penis and I was just sitting on the porch. I didn't see him at first. He said, hey, I looked over and that was like, he wanted me to see him. You know, that was his thing. He wanted to see that. Many different people in my high school reported that same experience and it was definitely a strange experience. Um, I didn't feel traumatized by that. Um, I was scared. I definitely was, um, like, afraid that he was going to try to, like, hurt me or, like, go into my house. Like, he knew where I lived, and that freaked me out for a while. But um, it was something, again, like, we talked about, like, normal responses to uh, trauma or stress. It, they typically go away within a few weeks of the experience, and that was my experience. It is creepy. Like, I'll always remember that that happened. I was walking to school, and a guy rode his bike and asked me and my friend to go with him. Mm, that's probably no good. Uh, another one is frauderism, which is being sexually aroused by touching or rubbing against a non-consenting person. People with frauderism will seek out their victims in crowded places, for example, on trains and buses. They're usually men and will rub up against the victim until they ejaculate. It's considered a crime, at least in Australia. Pedophilia, that's sexual attraction to children. Um, sexual masochism is intense sexual fantasies, urges, and behavior involving wanting to be humiliated, beaten, bound, or otherwise made to suffer for sexual pleasure. And sexual sadism is the person that wants to cause the pain. Voyeurism is the urge to watch an unsuspecting person who is naked, taking their clothes off, or engaging in sexual activities, or other activities that are considered private, such as having a shower. Um, the behavior is only regarded as voyeurism when the victim doesn't know they're being watched. Fetishism is using inanimate objects to become sexually excited. The most common fetishes are women's underwear, stockings, shoes, and dresses, but being aroused by a specific object doesn't necessarily mean you have a fetish. Finding an inanimate object arousing becomes a problem when that is the only way you can be sexually aroused. Objects that are designed for sexual pleasure, such as vibrators, do not count as fetishes. Transvestic fetishism is diagnosed in heterosexual men who have intense sexually arousing fantasies and behaviors that involve dressing in women's clothes. This is a problematic area for treatment as this form of fetishism is more common than is generally acknowledged. Often men come to the attention of therapists after they have been exposed, as it were. If it was more socially accepted, people would not need treatment. Um, zoophilia, sexual fixation on animals. Necrophilia, attraction to corpses. You threw a brick at the dude. <laughs> Urophilia, arousal from urine. And telephone scatologia, sexual arousal from making obscene telephone calls. And then there's a chapter that's like, what is normal anyway? Uh, per oh, this oh yeah, this is talking about personality disorders. So different categories of personality disorders are um, paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal, antisocial, borderline, histrionic, narcissistic, avoidant, dependent, and excuse me, obsessive. So there's paranoid personality disorder, which is characterized by a deep distrust and suspicion of other people. Uh, antisocial personality disorder, which is actually used to be called psychopathy or sociopathy. It's actually now called antisocial personality disorder, and it means that you're unable to feel empathy for other people. Borderline personality disorder, there's actually a troll out there that is telling people that I have this personality disorder, which is funny because I never really knew much about it, and I read it in this book, and I was like, at least... I think if you're going to say that I have a personality disorder that I don't have and have never been diagnosed with any personality disorder, any d disorder of any type, besides the ganglion cyst in my wrist, 
is that you should at least say that I'm narcissistic. Because, I mean, people could probably get down with that. I did really like this book, yeah. <laughs> I really hate that people accept necrophilia as normal. I'm not sure people accept that as normal, but okay. Um, borderline personality disorder is uh, one of the most widely studied personality disorders and is characterized by an unstable personal identity. Angry outbursts and impulsive and risky behaviors are common. <laughs> they talk about it more later, let's see. People with BPD have poor control of their emotions, experiencing intense and unstable emotional turmoil. They struggle to calm themselves when they get upset and regularly have explosive outbursts of anger. <laughs> I don't even really get angry. I get sad, usually. You have yet to see me blush. I, it happens sometimes. Impulsive behavior, such as substance abuse, risky sexual behavior, injuring themselves, overspending, or binge eating is common in someone with BPD. This behavior disrupts personal and professional relationships, work, school, and family life. Dramatic mood swings, inappropriate anger and difficulty controlling it, chronic feelings of emptiness, suicidal and self-harming behavior, impulsive and self-destructive behavior, history of unstable relationships, persistently unstable self-image or sense of self, fear of abandonment, periods of paranoia, and losing contact with reality. BPD is uh, borderline personality disorder, Erica. Okay, yeah, I got really embarrassed when I farted on him. <laughs> Sounds like a great person to invite to a party. Um, yeah, so that is what borderline personality disorder Causes are not completely understood, it does seem to run in families, and that trauma in childhood can lead to borderline personality disorder later in life. Um, there's a strong desire for attention for that person. Um, they talk about it a lot in this book, but mainly if you have any of these, you should always go see a therapist. Histrionic personality disorder is characterized by excessive attention-seeking behavior often have superficial or shallow emotional responses and are given to exaggeration but above all, they want to be the center of attention. They can be flamboyant, theatrical, and overly familiar with people, but they struggle to develop meaningful relationships. And then narcissistic personality disorder, they have a powerful sense of entitlement that causes them to think they deserve special treatment, have special powers, and are uniquely talented, brilliant, or attractive. They often act in a selfish, disrespectful way towards others and either overvalue or undervalue people. This leads to superficial relationships, they can get lost in daydreams of their own significance to the point where they don't get on with their daily lives. I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh. I need to work on this. I need to go to school and stop laughing about that. Oh, narcissistic people are fun. They, ought, they can get lost in daydreams of their own significance to the point where they forget to do anything else. Oh, that just amuses me. Come on, it's three in the morning. Let me laugh at some stuff. All right. Um... And by the way, this is going to be the last broadcast of the night because it's 3 in the morning and we've been live for 3 hours already. Not if you date one. No, no. No, it's not. No, definitely not. Um, avoidant personality disorder are socially inhibited, feel inadequate, and are hypersensitive to any negative criticism. They fear ridicule and rejection and will avoid social situations as a consequence. They have very limited social contacts and low self-esteem. Sometimes they also have anxiety and agoraphobia. Dependent personality disorder, I actually have a friend who is uh, considered codependent and actually goes to a codependent's anonymous group, which I never knew existed before, is characterized by a constant and excessive need to be taken care of by another person. People with this disorder fear separation from the person who cares for them and struggle to make decisions and take charge of their lives. The fear of losing this relationship makes them extremely vulnerable to manipulation, abuse, and exploitation. They can have chronic low self-esteem and seem submissive and self-sacrificing to an extreme degree. Obsessive personality disorder means being preoccupied with rules, regulations, and orderliness. Um, kind of borderline, you know, OCD. The last one before this one was called avoidant personality disorder. Do you have reasons for contribute to narcissism? I'm not sure what you mean by that spirit. Um, 
but you can, if you think that you might have it, you could go talk to a therapist. Mainly, like, if it's interfering with your life, like, you're unable to develop meaningful relationships, you don't have, you're not able to hold down a job, if everyone, like, if people tell you all the time, like, you're so full of yourself, like, you just think you're so amazing, and, you know, if you're hearing that a lot, then you might have that, and you might want to talk to a therapist about changing some of the behaviors that are pushing people away from you. Mindfulness is good for these things. It's all about self-awareness. Interpersonal training. You can learn interpersonal skills, how to basically um, be socially functional with people. It could be jealousy, too. What could be jealousy, too? Um, I mean, maybe, perhaps. But, I mean, if a lot of people, I mean, I don't. I don't know that most people are like that jealous to the point where they're gonna say to you like oh you think you're so awesome I don't hear people say that to me very often I used to have people tell me a lot that I always had to be right like I always felt like I had to prove that I was right or that I overthink things or I overanalyze things so I've tried to change my behaviors with those things that I think are problems not that people were jealous of me but that I had that those issues you know what I mean yeah, like if one person says it, yeah, maybe they're jealous, but like if everyone your whole life has said this to you, you know, you might be a narcissist. Emotional regulation skills, distress tolerance, there's all sorts of like basically skills that you can learn. If you show all these traits, does that make you normal? I don't think so. Oh, what do you mean? Like if you have interpersonal skills? There's really, what is normal? Is there such thing as normal? Okay, so the chapter 11 is eating disorders. This is, a lot of these eating disorders are based on control, which we talked about a lot with anxiety and with um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Exactly, Lenny, jinx. <laughs> a lot of times we said, well, I am always right. No normal on this channel, that's true. I see narcissism as undervalued. I think you guys are misunderstanding the, the, the definition of narcissism. So being proud, being confident, is not narcissistic, okay? Like having a strong self-image, feeling good about yourself when you're doing good things and being confident that you understand a topic well and that you're right in your opinions doesn't mean that you're narcissistic, okay? So like if you're not going to work because you're obsessing with how amazing you are, like you might be narcissistic, you know what I mean? Like these things, everything in this book, these are only disorders if they're impeding your ability to live a normal, healthy, balanced life. Wow, Lenny. Oh, okay, okay. So a lot of this has to do with control. If you feel like you're out of control in a certain area of your life, you may start becoming very controlling about your food. And if you're worried that someone in your life may have an eating disorder or you never really thought about it before, try to like think of people who are very controlling, like they're very controlling about the kitchen. They're very controlling about the food in a certain situation. They have to have complete control of the food. They might not be just a control freak and annoying, whatever you might think. They might actually have an eating disorder. They don't, it doesn't mean they absolutely do. They also could have OCD. They also could just want to have control over it and be very, like, particular. Um, but be aware that eating disorders are very hard to spot. People with eating disorders are not doing it for attention. They're, they're doing it because of their own self-image. So they have something called, let's see if I can find it where they look in the mirror and they see something different than what we see. They basically, like, they see themselves as heavier than they actually are. And I forget the term for this. I don't, it's not popping out at me here. Uh, I forget what it's called, but yeah, so they, they see, they look in the mirror and they actually see a fat person, even if they aren't fat. So it's not that they... Yeah, it's not like they're, it's it's a, a mental disorder and they need to seek help from a professional for it, for sure. Not body dysmorphia. It's like, it's like a specific thing when you see something different in the mirror than what other people see. Uh, they talk about how the eating disorders are much more common and prevalent in Western countries and first world countries because we have access to media and we idealize 
thin as an important body type. I weigh just over 100 pounds, and today I was looking down at my stomach, and I felt like it looked kind of fat. And I looked in the mirror, and I thought it looked really nice. I thought my stomach looked really nice. And I'm like, well, why does I, why am I looking down and feeling like it looks fat? And I turned to the side, and I saw, like, this little, like, half-inch little pooch. And I was like, that's nothing. That's no big deal. And actually reading this made me feel better about that. It's like, we don't, our stomach does not have to be perfectly flat to be considered, uh, you know, acceptable, acceptable and attractive. It's complete BS. That's like extremely difficult to obtain and maintain. And if you've had children, or if you have like hypothyroidism, or you have diabetes, you know what I mean? If you're struggling with other things, or you're on medication that causes you to gain weight, like it's totally, totally normal to have that. Um, there is a there is a, a a line between like being morbidly obese and you being so overweight that it's a danger to your health. You know, so there's like healthy, but there's a pretty wide spectrum of healthy. I mean, you could have some weight on you and be healthy. A perfectly, oh yeah, mine, mine rolls. Yeah. One of the kids the other day was like, oh look, it's a mouth. And I was like, I know a coworker who's obsessed with work. Don't know if that's a, like workaholism. It could be, it could be that they're trying to be really they're like they could be overworking because they have PTSD like we talked about earlier or something else where they're trying to distract themselves they could be having trouble at home like with um maybe they're going through a divorce or something you know is happening that they don't want to all he thinks and talks about is work I fall into that category I think I love my work a lot so when someone really loves their job I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing but um he could also be maybe like autistic too, where it's like difficult for him to socialize. So he just, that's like the thing that he's comfortable talking about or something. Could be like a struggle with social skills. So anorexia is, well, it's actually, so they talk about how with all of these eating disorders, they could sometimes like basically binge eat and then feel, especially with bulimia, and then feel so guilty about doing that that they get ill afterwards. Thanks, Diablo. Appreciate that. Oh, Diabolo. If you love your work, it's not really work, is it? Uh, I mean, it's 3 o'clock in the morning right now, and I'm pretty tired, so it feels like work even though I'm loving it. <laughs> One day we went to eat at Golden Corral, and he yelled about work all the way there. Well, maybe he had a rough day, right? Dysmorphobia? Mm. Are you trying to find the word that I'm looking at? Maybe it's that. That sounds like it could, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, here it is, yeah. Dysmorphophobia. Yeah, you got it. Dysmorphophobia. Um, when they look in the mirror, they see a larger person than others see. While not considered delusional, it is hard to shift and is a powerful reinforcer for them to lower calorie intake and over-exercise to the point of exhaustion and fainting. Yeah, that's a big one, that they might, exer they might exercise a significant amount. So they might still eat, but they exercise, they eat very small amounts and they exercise. It's and not everybody is going to present the same way with any of these disorders, right? But that's something that you could be on the lookout for too. If you think one of your loved ones may have it, or if you have it, if you have it, you probably already know that you have it. And I really encourage you to get help because chances are you actually aren't seeing the reality of your body. You think that you're fat, but you're probably not. If you're anorexic, you're at 85% of your average body weight, right? Katya, hi, you couldn't get in here, charge for like seven minutes, what the heck? Yeah, someone else got kicked out earlier, but hi, how are you? Hello, how's Hawaii today? And that people with eating disorders often don't present for treatment, so the percentage, the, the, stit, the stats are probably lower than they actually, you know, how many people are actually out there with it. How about this, I have a thing where I hate when people grab stuff off the shelf. You know someone like that exercising all the time? I think many celebs are anorexic. Absolutely, there's a huge pressure on people that are on screen to be thin. Thin is like, thin is in, right? And that's really, really unhealthy. Got stuck. Oh, that's, fr that's frustrating. 
same item from the top shelf because they're too lazy to reach further. Hey, well, I'm only five foot one, so if I'm not reaching to the top shelf, it's just because I can't reach it. People with binge eating disorder binge food regularly, but they don't necessarily have a disturbed body image, and they don't usually try to compensate for the binging by inducing vomiting or doing excessive amounts of exercise. So that's like probably comfort eating. A ton of young women have eating disorders. Yeah, but they also said that we have to be careful not to think that it's only young white women that have eating disorders, that men have eating disorders too. Um, athletes, professional athletes, tend to sometimes have eating disorders. They're very, they're very obsessed with their weights. And um, that homosexual men seem to have, it's like something like 50% of homosexual men have, okay, no, 15, 15. Um, no, 42, here it is, yeah, 42% 40, of men with an eating disorder identify as gay or bisexual. Okay, so it was 15% of gay or bisexual men have struggled with eating disorders, and around 42% of men with an eating disorder identify as gay or bisexual. Men too. Right, yes. It's, it's hard to spot, you know? So that's, that. I'm not trying to, yeah, there's a lot of young women with, I'm not trying to say like, like take away from your comment because it's totally right. But for us to be on the lookout for all of our loved ones, men, women of any age, you know, of any background, any um, ethnicity, to be on the lookout for people that are maybe very controlling about food, don't seem to be eating very much and are exercising a ton, Maybe talk to them, maybe bring it up, let them know that you care, you know, in a private, safe space with someone that you've developed trust with. Um, so dealing with an eating disorder, apart from getting professional help, which you should do, is all about getting support and using techniques like distraction and doing things to be kind to yourself. I love that they talk about distraction being a useful tool here because um, so often I feel like therapists say like, oh, you shouldn't use distraction, that it's a bad thing to do. But I, I find distraction to be very helpful for me sometimes. Most men overeat. I don't know, maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Don't weigh yourself. Try not to be controlled by the number. Prioritize timeouts and breaks. Allow yourself to relax and use mindfulness techniques that will help you stay calm. Engage in activities and distractions such as seeing a friend, reading a book, watching a movie, listening to music, singing, going for a walk, gardening, hanging out with us on Periscope. Ensure that you are eating nutritious meals, preferably with the advice of a dietitian. Cuddle with a pet or take your dog for a walk. Animals love you no matter what. Try to get out of the house and away from the eating disorder. Odamas, thank you for the super heart. Don't obsess about looking like someone in a magazine. It is not representative of the real world, and it's not even representative of them. It's photoshopped. Nine times out of ten, if not ten times out of ten, it's an edited photo. It's filtered. It's, you know, the cellulite's taken away, the the edges are trimmed, the faces are changed. I mean, they really, they, and that gives those people, the models and the celebrities, their own body image issues because they know what they look like and they see the product and they say, wow, they, they trimmed off the side of my, my hip here and they took away my little bumps and my wrinkles and wow, like this, this image of perfection, which is just not realistic and not healthy and just not real. Yeah, the Instagram duality, yeah. Bonding, connecting, syncing with people, healthy relationships truly helps. I agree. That's why I like this channel so much, and that's why I try to be live so much, and why I want this channel to be live 24 hours a day, because the power of connection is undeniable. That having a positive community to surround yourself with is very, very beneficial for mental health. Thank you, Blue Guy. I agree. I think I look better now than I did when I was 20 pounds lighter when I was 85 pounds. I see some of those videos and I go, whoa, that was crazy. I didn't have an eating disorder, but I just wasn't eating enough, I don't think, because I was smoking weed instead of eating. They turned Photoshop into surgery, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, your doctor will tell you if you're a healthy weight or not. My name's Taylor. <laughs> yeah, I was 85 pounds. Yeah, when I was with uh, Mr. P. Practice breathing exercises or relaxation techniques. This may help if you're having trouble sleeping. Keep a journal to track your thoughts and how you're progressing through treatment, which reminds me another series that we're going to be doing is about writing prompts. So we're going to be doing creative writing and stream of consciousness writing, and this is going to give us insight into how our thoughts are. I'm 28. That's how much I weigh now, Lenny, yeah. Talk to someone you trust about what you are going through. Seek the support of friends and family when you need to vent your feelings. Friends and family can provide moral and emotional support as well as practical assistance. Do not be afraid to ask for help. Remember, you are a person who can love and be loved. You don't have to subscribe to that club where thin is the ticket to success. The pressure, the pressure that that thinking puts you under is immense and leads to much heartache. Well, you could um, talk to a professional blue guy. Thanks, boxing. It's actually not my advice. It's from the book, so thank you. The book says thank you. <laughs> and the final chapter, chapter 12, is all about suicide. So they talk about like physician assisted suicide, people who have terminal illness or they're suffering or they're older and they have dementia and Alzheimer's and certain things like people wanting to die even though they're not necessarily depressed or suicidal. But I'm not gonna talk much about that because I don't think there's a ton of controversy about that. I think it's more about this part, the myths about suicide. Myth, the people who talk about suicide don't do it. The vast majority of people who take their own lives have talked to someone about suicide. Not only that, but a previous suicide attempt is one of the strongest predictors that a person will die by suicide. Talking about history, sorry, talking about thoughts of suicide and a history of suicide attempts is one of the most important factors to take into account in assessing suicide risk. Hi, Katie. Another myth. People who kill themselves have been diagnosed with mental illness. It is true that the rate of suicide is much higher in people with a mental illness, but that, but that they may have the illness that has not been identified or discussed with those left behind. Um, they may have, for example, issues with their sexuality, feel that they are a failure for not performing to their or their parents' expectations, or sadly, sometimes someone did not mean to end their lives, but were, were making a plea for help that went wrong. All right, bye, Blue. I know, Katie, I'm really tired. I'm almost done. It's the last chapter. Myth. If someone wants to kill themselves, nothing can stop them. The number of people who attempt but don't go on to die by suicide shows that people can and do overcome their desire to end their own lives. There are people whose need to die will overcome any prevention input. In most cases, though, talking to friends and family and getting professional mental health assistance can make a huge, huge, I can't even express that enough, huge difference to people and help them to see that their lives are worth living. Myth. People who take their own life are unwilling to seek help. Studies show that nearly 80% of people had seen their primary care doctor in the three months before they took their own lives, and 90% had seen some sort of health professional. People who want to end their lives feel that there's no option open to them and have usually struggled for a long time with their pain. Myth. I already have said this one earlier. Talking about suicide doesn't it's not a myth, but they're saying that some people don't want to talk about suicide because they think it gives people the idea to do it, and they're basically saying nobody commits suicide because somebody mentioned it, you know? Like, that's... don't be afraid to talk about it. So in Australia, six people every day die by suicide. So call the suicide hotline, see your doctor, talk to a friend, reach out, 
realize that it's a very permanent solution to temporary problems and you're not going to be able to make any other choices after you make that choice. So try every single other option out there first. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear that, Matt. Remember that it wasn't your fault and you, there's nothing you can do to or could have done to stop that. All we can do now is re think of the people we know that might be struggling, reach out to them, show love as much as we can, remind people that we love them, remind them that we're thinking of them, tell them specifically why, you know, things that we like about them, the parts of them that we really enjoy, spend time with them, try to spread love and positivity as much as we can. There's only so much we can do, you know? And that's the review and summary of this book, Changing Minds, the go-to guide to mental health for you, family, and friends. Great, great book. I'll be giving it either four or five stars. And I'm also going to be going to school now to become a psychotherapist myself so I can help people better. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, wait, what was the name again? Um, Thank you. Well, Popcorn. Popcorn sent $26.69. I see him in the broadcast now. Thank you for your support. And we got a brand new sponsor, Will Shade. Thank you for your support, too. It means a lot. And if you guys like this channel and you want to support content like this going into the future and adding more content to the channel all the time so that there's always this positive community that people can connect to, especially if they're feeling kind of down or had a rough day, nextjuice.com, click the support button. If you're watching on Periscope, then the link is right in the profile. Just click that. It'll bring you right to the support page. Any amount helps a ton. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can actually buy this book right from the link in the description of the video on eBay. Again, it's called Changing Minds. And I'll be doing a review on this on Goodreads. Plus, I'll be emailing it. Pat! Oh my god, Pat! Hi! I'll be emailing it out. I send three emails a year with book reviews and summaries. I read 52 books a year, so you don't have to, and it's totally free if you want to get that email. You can sign up for that on the website as well, nextjuice.com. Hey there, Victor. Hey, how you been, Pat? I'm just about to sign off. I'm really tired. It's 3.16 in the morning. I'm also really hungry, so I need to go take care of my physical health because we've been live for pretty much three hours straight. Thank you, Boxing. I appreciate that. Thank you, JC. Thank you, everyone, for all the positive feedback. Top contributor to the broadcast, Mr. Ed, with 36,000 super hearts. Sorry, Brent, you were so close. <laughs> He's such a troll, isn't he? Um, 31,000 super hearts, Brent. Thank you so, so, so much. And um, I'm glad that you loved this book as much as I did because I loved it a lot. JC, thank you for 5,000 super hearts. Trevor, 4,000. Thank you, Lou, for 1,800. The other Lou for 1,700. Abby, for over 1,000. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tina, Janine, Jamie, James, Jamie, James, and Greg for all the super hearts. I hope to see you guys back tomorrow. Oh, and I wanted to talk about we are still pushing to get 100,000 super hearts a day in June. We are way off track. We are nowhere near that goal at all, and I'm frustrated because we got 2.7 million super hearts in May, which is 3 million or sorry, 300,000 super hearts short of the goal, which is like it just felt like we were so close. We were right there. It's 3 million super hearts to get the $350 bonus at the end of the month. So, if you have any super hearts and you want to send them our way, it really helps any of the broadcasters you see on the channel that are live. Thank you for supporting them. Tomorrow it's uh Wednesday, so we're going to be have well, today now, right? We'll have Chris Angelis live at 9 p.m. Eastern Time with music. And at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll have Holistic Deb live with an hour of ASMR, calming, whisper, tapping content. And I'll be live for another three hours like I am every day. Thank you for those super hearts. Appreciate that. Who is that? It's Abby. Thank you, Batfish. Love you. Um, contact. Did I, I message you on Twitter, right? Did you get that? Let me know if you want to do that. Um, podcast. I think that'd be really cool. Maybe we can talk about this or something else. I think talking about live streaming could be cool. That's like one of my favorite things to talk about. So whatever you think, let's do it. You sent me back. Okay. Yay. Yay. All right. Awesome. I love you guys. And I check all my messages on Monday. So if you don't hear me from me until next Monday, just know that I'm slow. I check them once a week because otherwise I'd spend all day every day DMing people and I would never get any other work done and I have to read a book every week and I have to do a bunch of other stuff and I'm about to go to school and it's going to be crazy but I'm figuring it out and I wrote down all my tasks that I do for this channel so that I can 
delegate some of them and hire out some of the stuff and make sure that the business doesn't die as I try to go become a therapist. So I love you guys. I'm going to shut up now and maybe sleep at some point and maybe just eat this whipped cream all night. Okay, this has been a moment in time with Taylor. I love you guys. And I will see you on, thank you for the super hearts, Kieran, on the next juice. We're so close to 100,000. You make me want to like just sit here and be like, is this about to happen? Fish sticks. I know. I want to make fish sticks. But fish sticks take so long to make. It's going to be like a half hour until fish sticks. I should just sleep. The Taylor Marathon. It kind of is the Taylor Marathon. It is, we're at 99,000 super hearts. Does it say 100,000 on your guys' end? Sometimes mine's a little delayed. I'm just going to call that 100,000. I love you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all. Mm, thank you. Namaste. The light in me honors and recognizes the light in you. And I will see you. Yeah, 100,000. Okay, okay, okay. This has been a moment in time with Taylor. I love you. Mwah, mwah, mwah.